everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and heavily favored candidate for joining the Slaughterhouse Nine. I am joined today by my co-host, Scott Daly, who experienced a second trigger event while reading this section and now has the ability to turn any household axe into a fire axe. Scott, how's everything going this week? I'm doing just about as well as can be expected, Matt. Um, as you said, this is the podcast where you, a disturbingly unhinged worm expert, guide me, a first-time reader, through the thousands of pages of death and destruction as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, we're tackling Arc 13, Snare. And uh, Matt, holy crap, <laughs> this was a tough one. We're getting a lot of yeah. tough arcs. The Slaughterhouse Nine section of the book is is hard to read. Yeah, I feel like the last five to thirteen arcs or so, we've uh, we've began every episode <laughs> saying things are really escalating. Um, yeah, um, and we said at the end of the last episode that I thought that um, snare meant someone was going to be setting a trap for someone, and I didn't know who it was. Um, but uh, in classic worm fashion, um, everyone is setting traps for everyone. Mm -hmm. And there are so many traps going off in this uh, this section that I can't stand it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Uh, this um, the, Wild Bow never does just one thing at the same time. So no, not at all. And I mean, that is to say that, that I really I really loved this. I loved um, how it, we moved from this arc where Taylor was the hero the savior and then we immediately challenge that and we immediately challenge her um and a lot of really really bad stuff happens here that that puts to question uh, her actions her n necessity to constantly act um and there's a lot of you know brian taylor conflict here um mm -hmm. and it's it's really good i like it a lot yeah this is definitely it definitely feels like a local low point similar to how to how arc eight felt to me there's there's a lot of conflict between taylor and Brian, there's even conflict between Taylor and um, and Rachel, and and there's there's also surprisingly uh, a high amount of conflict between her and and even um, Lisa. Uh, in fact, I think the only undersider she doesn't have a conflict with this episode is Alec. He's too busy uh, being <laughs> being emotionless to yeah. uh, to get worked up in any of this. Yeah, and I think th that conflict stems from Taylor's need to be doing something need to be pushing forward need to be attacking the problem head on um and a lot of the other people are like especially brian are like whoa let's hold off for a second here and i think we're going to see the consequences of uh, that need in taylor uh, later in this arc yeah a lot of people are, are going to call taylor out on things that uh we have been calling her out on for some time now and that's <laughs> that's interesting, I think. Yeah, um, this is I am I am not going to be very nice to Taylor in this arc. Um, <laughs> I just want to set that that's that right here at the top. Um, first of all, I want to say I love Taylor. She's one of the most well-written characters I've ever seen. But uh, she takes some steps backwards here, I think, mm -hmm. uh, very intentionally um, as as the pressures against her and her team mount. So let's get into it, because this is yeah. this is a really dense chapter and we don't have a lot of time. All right. Yeah. So first, uh, some quick announcements. Uh, the We've Got Worm fan art contest. Uh, we wanted to give everyone a quick update uh, with what's going on with this contest since we hit our Patreon goal last month. Scott and I are still working out some of the fine details of exactly how we're going to do this first contest and what kind of prizes we will give to the winners. Uh, we will have an official announcement date um, as soon as the contest is open for entries. Right now, the plan is to pick a certain theme for you wonderful artists out there to draw something according to and then uh, have you submit the selections to us and then we'll pick the top three or five entries and then turn the vote over to our patrons uh for more information uh will be coming out in the next few weeks but we're very excited to get this thing started so thank you all who have donated to our patreon page to make this happen yeah yeah thank i think we just wanted to make sure that people know that that is coming we haven't said anything about it since we hit the goal but uh, it's coming we're working on it yeah, we we hit the goal faster than we expected, so now we're uh, playing a little bit of catch up. Yeah, admit it. which is awesome. It's a it's yeah. a good good problem to have. Exactly. All right. So the as for the Reddit comments and questions this week, first of all, uh, Maroon Sweater asks, "What did you make of how lenient Legend was to Madcap, especially given Battery's objections, versus how forgiving he was toward Taylor? Uh, sorry, how unforgiving he was toward Taylor in Arc Eight? 
Was he unforgiving to Taylor in Arcade? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I he he gave her the option to join the wards, right? Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like he he played more hardball with her. Like he wanted more concessions from her, but he was still just as eager for her to join the wards. Yeah, and I think um, the, the big difference here is that Madcap is the one offering it, whereas this was a. Uh, uh, a way to manipulate Taylor into getting them on their side, whereas he was freely saying, let me join you. I want to join you. Um, and so I think that's a little different, but I mean, it seems like they're generally, you know, uh, pretty lenient on, on especially young villains. Um, yeah. And it, I think the, the goal seems to be, we want to reform these people if we can get them in our group. Because, I mean, they do with Shadowstalker as well, who is obviously a very problematic villain. Um, yeah. So I think that it's a general... Uh, and, and it comes off as believable to me. I mean, they're so outnumbered that any help they can get... Um, I kind of bought the, the madcap uh, change of heart, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's probably... a You know, the, the villains already outnumber the heroes, like you said. And, and speaking of Shadowstalker, there was the issue with Taylor where she'd seen... Shadow Stalker's face, and and thus it was there was an additional wrinkle to that situation there. All right, uh, next comment. Uh, Web Snark asks or uh, asks. So you guys discussed how the Slaughterhouse Nine's villainy and the increased stakes make it harder to criticize Taylor morally. Does this change your evaluation of her earlier actions? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I think my my kind of point was around how it's so much harder to to judge her moral actions now because they're so much more gray than they were at the time. Um, it, some of the earlier stuff Taylor did, she was still kind of playing at superhero and um, in over her head, the bank robbery stuff, especially, I think we kind of, I'm not going to say attacked, but there were people that were very uh, surprised by our negative reaction to some of the stuff she did in the bank, but that's like a whole different kind of thing than what we're dealing with right now. So um, I, I think you know, she was terrorizing people with spiders, um, instigating conflict on her own. This is her doing stuff in response to mon- literal monsters coming to her, her city and her door. So um, I, I think I think we were fair on Taylor, you know, from the beginning. Um, and and I think that's I think we see in this this chapter that some of that judging we did is uh, intentional and was kind of put there for us to notice. Yeah, and and I think another thing is, I, I think we were only trying to judge Taylor by Taylor's standards in the first place. Like we're not hard on Lung because Lung isn't trying to be a hero, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, um, and and when when Taylor says she's trying to be a hero and then robs a bank and tor- and like terrorizes people, that's clearly a contrast, and it's clearly a failure, and it's clearly a self deception that's happening. Whereas in these chapters. She's she's doing some pretty questionable things, but I, I think there's maybe I don't know maybe you disagree, Scott. I think there's relatively less self deception here because she's she's actually facing the fact that she feels like she's failing fairly frequently. She just doesn't see any other choice. Uh, in the earlier arcs, she didn't have that excuse. Yeah, we, we I, I completely agree because we've we've talked about how her compartmentalization tends to fall apart on her. And I think we see it in this arc. We see her compartment like her compartments break down and uh, she's confronted with the reality of what she's done in the past and the failures that uh, or perceived failures even um, that have occurred to her. And she takes that and uses it um, to act more and to and in some ways to kind of double down on that kind of behavior. Um, Mm -hmm. so I I think you're absolutely right. I think this is, we're, we're kind of judging her on a different scale now. Um, so no, I guess that's a very long way of saying no. Um, I still think we were fair about what we said about her back in those early days of cops and robbers and, you know, just crazy bombers, which seems so innocent and quaint now. Yes. Yes. Context is important. That's, I think that's the point. Yeah. So, uh, Commenter Foxtail Lavender uh, says she wasn't a fan of how Assault and Battery's relationship was set up. She says, I think it was an attempt by Bo to write a cute romance, but he missed the mark. It came off as Assault harassing Battery for an uncomfortably long time. I think there are a lot of better ways that this could have been handled. What do you think about that, Scott? Yeah, I like this comment a lot because... um... You and I are men, <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, we don't. There's not a lot of uh, female representation 
on this podcast. Some would say uh, zero. Um, mm. So we look at things from our perspective, and this is something that um, I read this and I hadn't thought about it, and I went back and read the chapter, and, and I think uh, Foxtail has a, a real point here because there's there's a certain level of like this idea that if you ask a girl out enough time, she'll eventually say yes, as if like that's romance. Like, yeah, we, we, we all learned from Han Solo that, that you know, you're <laughs> supposed to basically sequester a woman aboard your starship and yeah. physically corner her. And that's the, <laughs> yeah, it's this weird, like no means try harder thing instead of yeah. no means no. And I think that's, that's a very important distinction. Um, so I, I just like this comment because I, I would hope that both uh, Foxtail and any other female listeners we have would keep bringing these comments to us because this is something from a perspective that I can't fully understand um, just just naturally like I, once I hear this co- comment I can go look at it and see exactly what they're talking about like yeah that's a that's a good point um, but so I'd love that kind of uh, that kind of perspective on this stuff so keep them coming thanks Foxtail for the comment I like that a lot all right well uh, thanks everybody once again for all your questions comments and discussion Audience interaction is really important to us, obviously, so we're always happy when we have so many questions and comments that we're forced to pick only a few of them. And now, let's move into ARC 13. Let's do it. This is All right. it's, it's really dense, guys. It's really yeah. dense. Yeah. So Taylor uh, starts off reading the terms of the nines test, which have been delivered on a piece of paper. Um, they are very detailed, and uh, among other things, they prohibit interference from Legends team, which is in town. And it turns out that Mannequin will be performing his tests first on the candidates uh, with two days of time allotted to him, which is one less day than everyone else will get because he has a penalty for losing to Skitter in the previous arc. Yeah, I think last week we talked about how I didn't really get um, how this Tattletale's whole let's change the rules on him and set up this weird thing, like really helped them. But I think... I think we're seeing that now because Jack kind of took this idea and ran with it and like really crippled their team. Um, They're still immensely powerful and have the biggest advantage, but um, he really like limited. He took the the rules that Taylor set up and really limited what they could do to like the nth degree. Um, And and they have an, an advantage. It's not it's a very tiny, tiny advantage because of this, but but they have it. Yeah, yeah. Or at least um, we're supposed to feel like they do at this point of the arc. And and they also seem to have given a lot of opportunities for the Brockton Bay residents to fight back, which uh, may or may not have been their intent. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, Taylor in in, in Coyle's base, she notes Lisa's new facial scar, which pulls down at the corner of her mouth in a a lopsided uh, Glasgow smile or more like a Glasgow frown, actually. Yeah, I I really like that we take the time to look at this because it, it goes back to uh, consequences. Um, we're seeing a consequence of, of their encounter with the Nine, and it, this isn't like your uh, weekly show where everything resets by the end of it. Like, she's now been scarred, and uh, it, it is affecting her both physically and emotionally. Yeah, yeah, and we know we know inside her head well enough to know that she's uh, putting on a brave face. Yeah, Right, right, yeah. So the other capes who are present, which includes uh, the other undersiders and the travelers, compliment Taylor on her defeat of Mannequin, uh, but she is still not able to take the praise. Yeah, and this is just like picking up the through line from last arc of Taylor's complete inability to see her successes and her successes and only focus on her failures and the self-doubt and projection that she does. Um, So we're picking that right back up and we're going to take it right into this arc um, and see where that leads us. Yep. I, I, I don't know, Scott. Uh, it, so so um, it, they talk about how Hook Wolf is currently advocating consolidating all the Brockton Bay capes into a giant army and just crushing the nine. But uh, they don't want to do that for, for various reasons. Yeah, like how they say this is a really bad idea and then like do that exact same thing later in the arc, but with less people. So Yeah, right. <laughs> Basic, yeah, basically every individual team just ends up having the same idea and not banding together. Yeah. So we, we also get more Noel flavor here, uh, where Trickster says, if Siberian does get to Noel, then Noel would probably make it out, but everyone else wouldn't. Yeah, I really like, I, I'm, I'm starting to really like the, the 
traveler's detail we get. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of sprinkling about them. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here about how they don't seem to really be gelling as a team. They seem generally frustrated and unhappy and uncomfortable around each other. Um, and like the only thing that's holding their team together is this vague promise that's related to Noel some way that we don't really understand yet. Um, I really like all this stuff and I, I'm kind of tracking it through this arc and through the rest of the story. Um, I said this to you over Messenger earlier, but it's starting to feel to me like we're starting to turn the gears to set up the the post slaughterhouse nine conflict to be something to do with these guys um and i and I can see that happening as we hint towards uh, the things that they're doing. It's cool, yes, and of course, I made no response whatsoever, yeah, but yeah i, I, I like to <laughs> I, I like uh, I like trickster's character uh quite a bit, and I, I like the team dynamic where he's the leader, but they all kind of hate him. I think that's very interesting to, to to read yeah absolutely i'm looking forward to see where that goes and and who these guys are yeah so uh taylor learns here that the nine have eliminated eliminated the merchants which she has some mixed feelings about and uh and then aisha says that she wants to spy on the nine by essentially just kind of looking for them and hanging around them because her power allows her to do that at least in theory and brian shockingly thinks that's too risky and won't let her but he's he's right. Brian's yeah. right. He's, Let the record show. He's actually proven right. So yeah, the the two siblings argue petulantly, and then Imp stands up and leaves and uses her power to just confuse the hell out of everyone, uh, except except Lisa, who who um, I think pretty much confirms if it wasn't already confirmed that she has you know some major advantages when it comes to remembering Imp's presence. Yeah, I, I don't think it's like perfect recall, but I think her power lets her connect the dots that says oh yeah this person's here mm -hmm. yeah. Um, why, why, why is brian standing up oh yeah the that person right <laughs> um uh, did you have any doubt if you can go back to the first time you read this do you did you have any doubt that imp was going directly to spy on the nine after this exchange like there there was no doubt in my mind yeah i i think that was i think that was pretty clear i mean it's 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 interesting i mean at this point we have such a such a I don't feel like Aisha is is well drawn yet until her interlude, and and then I think she really starts to be like a full character in my mind. Like I I wasn't seeing her as like a full undersider. I think until maybe the end of this arc, but I think at the end of this arc, she kind of earned her place. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that, and I think a lot of the the problem with seeing her as a full undersider is you can't see her. <laughs> so like, <laughs> there's so many sections where she's there but just not there. Um, yeah. and, and we, we shine just enough light on her here to make her feel like part of the team. I agree with that. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So Skitter, Rachel, Gru, and Genesis, um, form a little task force to go check on things in various areas. And that group prepares to settle in and form a defensive position in Skitter's territory. But before they can really settle in, Mannequin shows up and uh, trip some of her spider web sensors, but then backs off, leaving everyone spooked. Yeah, I think this is, we talk about first chapter being set up every week. Um, this is setting up kind of what's going to happen for the remainder of the arc. Uh, we set plans, we have ideas, we go to execute them, and then bam, someone from the Nine shows up and kind of throws all that uh, in the lurch. And that's kind of what happens again and again and again in this arc. And it's kind of, the, the ground is laid for that right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So moving into 13.2, uh, the little super team checks in with Gru's territory and verifies that Imp is indeed not there. Taylor does a little managing of Gru's leadership here vis-a-vis -vis Rachel because Rachel is uh, not really engaging with them. And and uh, so Taylor signals him confront her, be leader. And um, I wanted to get your reaction to this. Yeah, to me, I think this just enforces again and again that Brian's skills and leadership seem to be more battlefield related and his people management skills just are not up to the leadership task. Um, he can take someone else's plan and he can execute it. He can give orders. He can do all that. But he just really kind of sucks at managing people. Um, and I like that Taylor really like tried to let him do this here. And then like as soon as she noticed that he was just failing at it, she just jumped in. Um, and that's kind of. Again, a little microcosm of the, the Brian Taylor whole conflict where she uh, just wants to jump in and she's got to do something. She's yeah. got to act. 
Yeah, I, I think the wording is even something like she couldn't help herself. She couldn't keep herself from jumping in. Yep. Um, which which she'll actually do more and more throughout this arc. Yeah, and, let's uh, call arc 13. She couldn't keep herself from jumping in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I let's... think that fits basically everywhere. Yeah. And uh, and and it is indeed a point of uh, some conflict there. Yeah, and I think we should bring up again the fact that Brian has some leadership issues when we get to what happens to him at the end of this arc. Yeah, absolutely. So Lisa calls and lets them know that Panacea is in ballistics territory, alone and avoiding attention. So they had to check on her, guessing that her appearance here might be related to the Nine one way or another. Skitter um, finds her and appraises her of the quote-unquote messed, uh, messed up version of Survivor that the Nine have laid out. And Amy admits that Bonesaw nominated her. And uh, I really think this conversation is very interesting. This is one of s at least four conversations in this story that uh, are in this arc, rather, that are that are very important to to Taylor's development and very intense and dramatic and engaging. So you see Amy being very hard on herself and and seeming to have internalized Bonesaw's nomination. Um, basically, uh, you're seeing a lot of reflections of how how hard Taylor is on herself, and and Taylor is almost giving Amy the compassion that she should be giving herself. Uh, I just I think this is a fantastic conversation. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, and I think you're right that there are conversations throughout this arc that are reflections of how Taylor's feeling about herself, and this one is very specific to uh, her internalization, uh, her blaming herself, um, and it is great, and it, it it's very interesting to me that. Taylor, like, is aware of her compartmentalization when it comes with dealing with other people. Like, she, like, I love this quote, like, maybe because doing the right thing is hard in trying to, to talk Amy into helping out. And, like, she sees it a lot in other people and can't see it as much in herself. Um, and I think it's very interesting. And it, it almost takes, like, her talking through other people to realize this about herself as well. Um, yeah. And that's really cool. Yeah, and it, later later on, I think we'll point it out when it happens to Legend basically says to her, like, well, you can just do the right thing. And and she doesn't have this retort of just being like, that's an oversimplification. I mean, it, it, she is less willing to take it as a as a criticism, I think, at that point. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's it's like when it's applied to her, she holds herself to this impossible standard. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, no, I think I think and that's that's how she compartmentalizes, man. It's like it, her what's important to Taylor is how he she feels about it, not necessarily how others do. So if she considers it a failure, it doesn't matter that 20 other people say it's a success. Um, if if she thinks it's the right thing to do, it doesn't matter if other people say it's not the right thing to do or um, it, it's she's very focused on like how she perceives things. Yeah. I think uh, I think we can we can highlight that a bunch of times going forward here. Yeah. So just as she begins to make some progress with Amy and, and maybe Panacea is actually going to come with her, Skitter is yanked up by the neck seven stories as Mannequin descends to street level using her as a counterweight. Uh, she signals Gru and Rachel with her bugs to help uh, to help Rachel uh, to help uh, Amy as Mannequin basically trounces everyone. He pins Amy to the wall through her hand with the knife blade and then uh, shoots several of the dogs with his gun arms that he now has installed, um, killing Lucy. And then he leaves a knife bearing a message in Bentley's head and escapes. Yeah, they're like completely taken apart here. Like they're caught flat footed and they just get devastated. And of course, another puppy dies because Wild Bo enjoys it when I'm sad. Um, and I, I really do think that this does a lot. First of all, it. It sets a. It establishes. You know, we saw her defeat Mannequin last arc, but he's still very strong. He's still a very effective person. He can kill them all super easily. Um, so a, it says, hey, Taylor's victory last arc really was a victory. Um, and then also, our guys are in trouble because really the only reason they didn't all die here was because he specifically doesn't want to kill them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of those things about tinkers is that. You know, from from battle to battle, Taylor can bring different equipment and she can bring different tactics. But a, a tinker, especially a tinker like Mannequin, can just bring a whole new body with a whole new bag of tricks and yeah. es essentially might as well be a whole new set of powers 
in terms of what we see him do this arc. So after that fight, we learn that Amy can actually uh, cannot actually heal herself, and she is completely freaked out because she's not really a combat cape at all. So she runs away as Taylor realizes that Mannequin wasn't interested in killing them, but rather making her suffer. So uh, she knows he's going to go kill her people. So she heads off to her territory on the dogs. Yeah, and we're just at the, still at the beginning of the arc here, and <laughs> we're already getting to bad, bad stuff, and it's only going to get mm-hmm. worse from here. Hooray. Yep, yeah, we, we lost the dog on, on chapter two, so that's not, a, it's not, it's not looking out. So we, the next chapter is the first interlude of this arc. It's the, it's the Aisha imp interlude, um, and we start off with a depressing tableau of trashy people taking stolen merchants' drugs, which then turns out to be a slice of Aisha's home life. Uh, so in this scene, she's basically just being a voyeur and sitting there with her power active and watching everyone with no one aware that she's present. And she learns that her mother is pregnant. Um, and this is very depressing to her. And I, I don't know, I thought this was really interesting and maybe contradicted a lot of kind of what I expected to see inside Aisha's head. Uh, it turns out that she has quite a lot of self-awareness. Um, but but on the other hand, she definitely has a lot of triggers that put her in a bad headspace when she uh, when she runs across them, which she tends to run across them fairly often, it seems. Yeah, I agree with that. And and I, I really like how this starts. Um, one of the coolest things about the interludes is that if you're not looking at them on the table of contents, you don't see who the interlude is, whose like head it's in. Um, so we start and we just see this random group of three bums, and it's only till later we realize that, hey, we're in Aisha's head. This is her mom. Holy crap. Um, and it's it's good at like show don't tell. It's like we learn all these things by seeing it. Um, it's really cool. And it's also interesting that that Wild Bo chose to do Aisha's chapter that way because you aren't aware of Aisha's presence until she interjects herself yep. into into the narrative, you know, voice. Absolutely. In other words, she's invisible until she just chooses not to be. Um, which interestingly, we get the confirmation that her, her power is actually default on. So she's unless she's actively turning off her power, she's invisible and imperceptible to everyone. So this is yet another power that's basically a cruel joke specifically tailored to the cape. Yeah, but I think it's also one of like the most thematically strong powers that we've seen. Um, like, I love this idea, like to to Aisha, she is invisible. She sees herself as invisible and she doesn't want that. Like she wants people to see her. So really, you can look at it as her superpower in this case is to make people see her um, since it's default, like it's default on. So like her ability, her activating her ability is to make people see her. And I like that a lot. I think that that works very well. Yeah, I like that too, Scott. I think that's a really interesting inversion. Yeah, and and then she's also noticing that her power seems to be waiting around to do something else, but it never actually does it. Just wondered, wondered what your take was on this. Yeah, it seems kind of heavily implied that as some sort of like specific targeted memory loss thing that's not like because the way it describes her power is it just makes them forget Aisha specifically. And in that moment, so maybe this is memories not related to Aisha, something completely separate. Like if she learned how to flex this power, she could just remove memories from anyone's head, um, which seems like it could be very powerful. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if she has the patience to develop that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see where this goes. Um, I just like I like this moment where she she thinks to herself, um, Ironically enough, she knew that if she deactivated her power, she'd have even less chance of talking to her mom. That's just a perfectly sad little yeah, sentence. Uh, man. So she leaves this depressing place after trying to kind of sabotage her mother's attempts to take drugs and uh, failing generally. And then she heads to the scene of the merchant's massacre which she's obviously able to just walk through because no one notices her. And she follows various smears of blood from the scene to a building and then follows the blood trail up to the third floor of this building and just walks into the apartment where several of the Slaughterhouse Nine are hanging out. I love the touch that Shatterbird and Burnscar are just calmly reading together on the couch while Bonesaw performs torture surgery on the dining table. Oh, you, you, you love that touch, Matt? I love it. You, you love it? It's, mm-hmm. it's horrifying. Yeah. No, but I, I know what you mean, though, because it's there's something just so uh, domestic about it. 
um, mm-hmm. and it's like they're these like otherworldly monsters, and we just see them hanging out. Um, and it's yeah, it's God, I, I hate these guys so much. Yeah, well, it it kind of makes sense. Like I'm I'm actually glad we get this one little tiny snapshot because I don't know. I, I before this point, I definitely found myself thinking like, so what are they? What do these people do all day when they're not actively killing people? Are they just like sitting in a room together, like staring at each other or it's like, oh, well, they're just kind of hanging out, just kind of reading books, you know, whatever, torturing people. It's all good. So, um, (laughs) yeah, it turns out uh, Aisha lacks Skitter's childish scruples about uh, killing, especially when she's watching Bonesaw torture someone to death. So she promptly stabs Bonesaw in the throat and then slashes her throat and then stabs her in the eye, none of which does anything because Bonesaw. Yeah, we uh we get a, a really detailed explanation for exactly why um later in the arc, but in this moment you're like, oh my god, these people are indestructible. She's dead. It's like you're just like shit. This is how this is gonna end. Yeah, that yeah, I, I do remember that being a really effective like like oh no moment because you're like oh yeah she's gonna get her yes we're gonna kill Bonesaw and then nope stabs her repeatedly and it's just like does basically nothing. So uh. Yeah, she she leaves and then literally bumps into Jack outside, who, of course, doesn't actually notice. Uh, And then she follows Cherish into a closet, um, aiming to kill her when she's alone. But Cherish senses her and luckily prefers to make a deal rather than say anything. Yeah, we never actually learn what this deal is, right? Um, At least not in this arc. I mean, I, I, I thought that it was something that it was basically just like you know, get me out of here and I will give you guys something in return. Um, yeah. I mean, Aisha doesn't actually do. So yeah. all we know is that they were supposed to meet in a different room of the same, uh, place that they, that the slaughterhouse nine are in, but that doesn't work out. That's so maybe, mm-hmm. maybe we'll learn more about that later. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think we get too much clarity into it, but I, I think it doesn't really matter at this point, at least. So we go into 13.3 and we're back with Taylor. They're racing on the dogs, trying to trying to beat Mannequin back to Skitter's territory. But Taylor realizes that he is, in fact, faster than the dogs when he's going all out. They end up finding him in the middle of the road in her territory, surrounded by corpses and having defeated uh, Stegosaurus scorpion form of Genesis. And then he uses a invisible gas attack, which incapacitates Rachel and Bentley before they can even react to the presence of it. And um, Skitter orders Bastard to retrieve Rachel from the gas cloud, which he does. Because Bastard's the best little doggo ever. I love him. <laughs> Good wolf doggy. So there's a lot of complicated fighting here that I'm not going to, to, to summarize in a, in, a, in a precise way, um, other than to say that um, Skitter uses her, her wits to realize that Mannequin is being a little bit cautious of the gas, and thus it's probably flammable. And so she, they kind of play a, a little bit of a, a, a back and forth here, where eventually she kind of manipulates the situation such that the gas gets detonated, but it doesn't really hurt Mannequin too much. Um, it does give Bastard an opportunity to grab him and, and crush his arm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I like this a lot because before we started reading this, you kind of described the battles in this to me is kind of like a game of chess sometimes and um i didn't i don't always see that in some of these battles but this is one of the ones where you really do because like mannequin and taylor face off they probe each other for weaknesses um taylor outsmarts him he goes away he comes back countering the things that she used last time um but his counter opens him up to a new weakness and then she exploits that strategy um and wins and i I just think that's really cool yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 really fun. Like it's uh, the, I, I always I always has I always never know what level of detail to go into with like the fight summarizing because it's actually really awesome and it's some of my favorite parts of the story. It's just there's there's generally speaking less like critical analysis and and so forth to do when you're just talking about a really cool fight scene. So yeah, I, I think I think we can generally say this was cool. This was fun. I liked. Mm-hmm how the, I liked how it uh, laid itself out and it was, it was exciting to read. Yeah. So the three undersiders are left pretty brutally beaten up and they're actually prepared to finish off mannequin. Um, but then burn scar arrives out of nowhere and uh, tags herself in. So now it's cheater. 
it's her turn and Mannequin forfeits the rest of his turn because he lost. Twice. Suck it, Mannequin. Yeah. That's right. It's overconfidence. So we move into 13.4. Burnscar lays out her test for Rachel, which is that she needs to murder her only remaining human connection, uh, which is, of course, they know because of Cherish, they know that she has this... Um, she has, you know, the only remaining shred of human connection she has is to the other undersiders. And so Burnscar is saying, yep, you, you need to kill your friends or we're going to kill your dogs. Um, and Rachel actually seems to be considering this because, as we know, um, her dogs are very important to her and her feelings toward the undersiders are a bit strained right now. Um, but it, obviously it's it's not like an easy choice for her because she's not a monster. She's just a very damaged person um yeah it's so good though because it just relates back to her central conflict like it relates back to that whole lone wolf or pack dog thing um you kill your your pack you're no longer the pack dog and you become that lone wolf or you don't do that and we'll kill the only things you feel at home with so as much as i still think that rachel would never do this like this is the closest i got to saying oh no maybe she will because this is like to, to threaten her dogs like I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree that it, I, I think it, it felt like it was going to come really close. And in, in fact, I, I wouldn't say I think the first time I was reading, I, I probably thought there was a good shot that that this was the moment where Rachel was going to, you know, snap because she's she's not a she's not a, a, a I don't want to say she's not a good character, but she's not like perfectly good and, and upstanding she she makes a lot of mistakes and, and bad choices so it's easy to believe that she would fall in this particular way and that she, her story would be a tragic one yeah and, and she like taylor has her own uh moral code system and rationale for her action so you can see you can see a, a line of thinking where she decides that that's the right thing to do mm -hmm. yeah that's true i mean yeah she, she's had no problem like maiming innocent people before so um, so yeah, they, they managed to distract her and, and use capsaicin bugs to kind of, uh, get an out from, from burn scar and they end up staggering out of the inferno created by her and down to the beach. <laughs> if by staggering out, you mean they got like blown up and lit on fire as they ran away. <laughs> okay. And literally, literally like badly burned. Yes. Yeah. Like she's second degree burns, like all down her legs. Yeah. So there's just this little bit where Taylor is being hard on herself again. I'm just going to read. I'd cut ties with my dad, dropped out of school, helped get Lung arrested, and started a chain of events that had led to the ABB terrorizing tens of thousands of people. I had served as a distraction for so a power-hungry supervillain could kidnap a girl and keep her drugged up in some underground cell for months. I'd stood by and let a man die. I'd become a full-fledged villain, pledged to protect people, and then let them die it horribly. Not once, not twice, but three times. Hey, Matt, wasn't this like all the stuff that we we pointed out? <laughs> Yeah, and I and I almost think that you may have said something like, "I hope that Taylor at some point gains some level of self awareness for her <laughs> responsibility for these events." No, and and I I love this, and I'm glad you pointed this quote out because like she's in this moment of utter defeat. Like she says this as she's watching her territory burn, like her territory is just on fire, um, and, and in her lowest point in her defeat, like all these compartments just kind of come down. Um, and you know, we, we came off sometimes as a uh, mean to Taylor or uh, judging of Taylor. Um, but we, throughout all that, were never half as mean to Taylor as she was to herself. Um, and, and, and I want, like, I've said it again and again, that the important part of all this is not what I think morally about her actions. It's what she thinks. And it's very clear here is that it was a big deal to her that she felt guilty, that she feels responsible. That, that is the important part. Um, and, and we see that here, that she does feel that, that, that maybe we can have an argument of whether it was okay to leave Thomas to die or not. But she says right here, I stood by to let a man die. And that's, that's important. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then the only other important thing is, okay, now that you've come to this realization, what are you going to do about it? Um, and we'll see that in a few minutes. Yeah, because th that's that's the thing. Like, we're not just like ragging on Taylor because we enjoy making her feel bad because 
he's fictional. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's more like we want to see her transcend this and and learn something and right. grow. Right. And, and and we do see this start to happen here because she she achieves some some heights in various regards. She she achieves some measure of strength by hitting bottom in this particular regard. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still plenty of concerns that come out of that finding of strength, but you're yeah. you're absolutely right that right. Um, we are going to see. You know, a lot of people they come to this moment of utter defeat and they roll over and they give up, and that is not who Taylor is. That is not what Taylor does. Um, there's this this inherent strength to her. Yeah, right. I, yeah, I definitely don't think that this is a, this is a moment where where she finds true heroism but it is a moment where she finds kind of reserves of strength that she hasn't tapped yet yeah yeah so yeah so they remember while they're staggering along the beach uh grew and her do uh, that that genesis is in her lair uh, in taylor's lair i should say um which might currently be on fire so they need to go help her out so they take the storm drain entrance um on the beach up into her base and inside her lair they find charlotte with a mess of kids hiding and um genesis in her you know human human genesis uh, sleeping so taylor orders charlotte to take the kids into the storm drain and realizes that genesis needs a wheelchair which uh we didn't know yet yeah this is the first time we've seen genesis in the flesh um and i still didn't really have a clear understanding of how her power worked um and now we get some of that flavor text and it's it's pretty cool i like it a lot yeah yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to remember what we know when, but yeah, it's it's cool that she's. Uh, uh, we we had no idea, like we we knew it was a projection, but we didn't even really know what that meant. Yeah. So Taylor's getting uh, as they're cooped up in in the lair, just just her and Gru basically with Genesis still asleep at this point. Taylor is getting really aggro. This is a this is a fairly important scene for her. She's basically preparing herself to just head out again and fight, even though there's nothing she can do. And her power is almost useless against Burnscar. And Gru actually at this point has to physically restrain her and basically like push her against a wall. Um, and she, she, you know, she's saying, I'm going out there. They're just bullies. They're powerful. They've got every advantage. But that's all the more reason we can't let them get away with this. So it's this very like justice minded mentality without much concern for practicality in this moment. Yeah. And there's that that, that B word again. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love I love pointing out every time it's used because it's so important and central to everything that Taylor is and everything that Taylor does. Um, and like we were talking about a few minutes ago, this is this is why I love Taylor, um, because she's in this moment of defeat um, and she she doesn't give up. She doesn't throw up her hands. Um, she goes she goes and acts. And this is great and it's inspiring, but it's also kind of troublesome, right? Because Taylor's kind of flaw is that she can't not act. She has to go. She has to do something. And she's reckless to a fault with it. And Gru stops her here. She probably would have gone out there and died because she's like burned and like not in a position to fight. And I think this is this is kind of like an encapsulation of their arc through this arc, which is that she's reckless. She goes out there and he's the one that can rein her in a little bit. Um, and he seems to be the only one capable of doing that. Yeah, uh, th there's an intensification of a lot of the character relationships here where, you know, we, we've had we've had Gru push back on her many times over the last few arcs. This is the first time he's been like, stop, <laughs> put yeah, his hands yeah. on her. You know, it's it's the the um, the intensity of things is escalating. Yeah. So at, at this point, though, kind of in the middle of this altercation that they're having, Genesis wakes up and Taylor kind of comes to her senses with this other witness present. But she does come to the resolution that um, the the Brockton Bay folks aren't going to make it through eight more rounds of this because Jack has things too planned out um, and that they're going to need to take the fight to the nine one way or another. So she 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 says, so we go for the indirect attack. They want to play dirty. Let's play dirty back. Yeah, because sinking to the level of the slaughterhouse nine won't have any long term consequences at all. <laughs> yeah oh boy no i, I the, like and it's we're going to talk about this as we go taylor's plans and taylor's quote-unquote recklessness and what that leads to um 
and it's tough because on one level you understand that she's probably kind of right that they're not going to win doing things the way they were doing things. Um, but on the other hand, you're very concerned for um, these people that seem to be willing to do whatever it takes to win this fight. Um, not even like closing the door on what it takes is. So, I, yeah, I, I think we'll we'll get into the details, obviously, in, in terms of in terms of what's about to happen. Um, but, you know, we're definitely entering a domain where it's the the issues are less about the morality of Taylor's choices and more about the uh, maybe strategic wisdom of them. Yeah, I, I think that's I'm, fair. I'm going to have to revisit maybe that that phrasing or that conceptualization as we as we get into this. I think there will be ample time to do that. Yes. <laughs> so we move into 13.5. Uh, Taylor is back on the street helping Rachel pry Bentley, the dog Bentley, out of the monster Bentley's chest uh, to make sure he's still alive. And once again, this is one of those great conversations that happens in this arc. Uh, this is maybe one of the best in the whole story. At least that's how I felt while I was reading it, because everything just gets laid out here. Taylor's, as we just saw, she's been pushed to the breaking point, and she's kind of breaking in all the right ways right here. She's She's really connecting, I think, with Rachel, actually. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I love this a lot, too. Um, and like we said, there's a lot of things that Taylor does in this arc that I don't particularly like. But um, she comes out of this situation with, like, I've got no fucks left to give. And she takes that, that mindset and, like, puts it towards her relationship with Rachel. And I think they're finally able to break through a wall in their friendship that they hadn't been able to before um, because of this, like... Like, look, we just have to lay it all out here. Like, we don't have time to fuck around anymore. Like, things are serious now. Let's get over this. And I think it's really powerful and important. And it's uh, consequently, like, the exact right way to approach Rachel with all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, they don't exactly hug here. But um, but but she basically, Rachel's like, I'm not your friend. And Taylor's like, I don't care. I'm your friend, despite all the shit you put me through. Yeah. And And, and Rachel because because of who she is and how basically how how abused she is she's you, you know that that you know that that reaches her even if you know it doesn't seem to i guess um and uh, yeah taylor does say that they're kindred spirits which i believe is exactly what siberian said yeah and you see her like noticeably flinch i love that mm -hmm. moment where like you see her react to that it's so good yeah yeah and then here's my favorite moment um <laughs> where they become best friends forever again. Um, where Taylor says, I want to take these fuckers down. No holds barred. And we're going to need your help if we want to pull it off. Screw going on the defensive. I, you had me at no holds barred. <laughs> I love that so much. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we should also point out how, how uh, Rachel accuses her of, of using like words here this this thing this thing with Rachel where it's like this is just words this doesn't mean anything which I think is is great actually yeah but it's also I think it like Taylor is not a words person <laughs> Taylor is mm -hmm. an actions person so this I mean it, this to me feels like Rachel is projecting onto Taylor the failings of other people she's dealt with um mm -hmm. because that's not how Taylor is at all so yeah um it's good I like it it, it ties into Rachel's psyche but it's interesting because says Taylor's not a words person. Yeah, well, and it comes back. It comes back in a little bit. Right. But, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So they they go back to the lair together, and Taylor has to peel her armor off of her burned skin excruciatingly. Genesis is putting out fires with a slug rabbit form, but she can't really put out the larger fires. So Taylor's territory is pretty pretty ruined um, in a lot of ways. When Genesis returns, Taylor announces her intent to, to attack the nine. And um, here we learn a little bit about the limits of Genesis's power. She can sort of select what she wants to uh, to project as she fades into sleep, but there are always trade-offs of various kinds. Taylor asks eventually if she's in a wheelchair because of her power, and Genesis says no, it was the other way around, if anything. Um, so this causes her to puzzle about the Travelers a bit more. Yeah, and I like this this moment where she realizes how powerful Genesis's power is, and she's like, "If I had her power, damn it!" And I, I like that reaction because, like, 
she Taylor kind of has no real concrete understanding of like outside of just descriptions of exactly how Genesis power works, but she's automatically like, I could use this better. Like I'd be better with this. Yeah. Um, and, and that's an interesting little beat, but yeah, I mean, again, we get more travelers flavor text again. Like we're getting a little bit more about what's going on with them. Um, how uncomfortable they are. What, like it's just little sprinkles and, and it's interesting, but I don't know what to do with them yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, the travelers and the rest of the undersiders show up at, uh, at, her, at her lair. And this prompts Taylor to go into a little speech about how the undersiders are scary, um, which is something we've definitely highlighted before, and how the undersiders' tactics relate to the tactics of the Nine. Um, Taylor describes the the undersider tactics basically as calculated recklessness don't k- get caught up in a fight think through the plan and um basically insinuates that this is also the strategy of the nine and that this is kind of the, the the undersiders need to play to their own strengths and, and use this against them uh, so so first of course they verify that everyone present is willing to kill if needed <laughs> hey escalation um yeah. I, I I love this moment a lot. I love I think Taylor specifically says the nine are us on steroids, and I really love that she's so conscious of that connection between them. Um Matt, how how did the Are You Willing to Kill a moment land for you like the first time you read it? Because like like I said, this is to me this was like real escalation. Like the gloves have come off um and like they're not fucking around anymore. This is serious. Yeah, so for me this not just that moment, but this whole kind of framing and and sequence of events that's about to happen was part of a st- a shift both in terms of stakes and in terms of tone into something that that I'm am loosely thinking of as like more of a Tom Clancy novel, where the idea is is that you're you're going to accomplish a mission, um, and the mission in this case is basically like an assassination mission. Uh, you know, a fairly complicated, like special forces mission, basically. And you have whatever, whatever tools that you can, like literally whatever tools you can get access to, you're entitled to use, which is really uh, a departure from what we've been doing up to this point where uh, everyone was very cir- circumscribed by the norms of the Cape community. Yeah, and I think uh, the the moment where they get bombs and guns um, kind of cements that change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I saw you, you you pointed that out here, and I, I really love that because like we've seen these like superheroes play with um, like superpowers, like lasers, and all this stuff, and it, it, there's been death, and there's been destruction, and there's been, but the, it, it kind of existed in this fantasy world of superheroes, um, and then guns and bombs are mundane weapons they're they're human weapons they're human tools of violence created to destroy and that's just like a whole separate distinction from like the fantasy like comic booky type stuff um yeah and it just adds a level of of reality to everything like they're not playing cops and robbers anymore for sure this is war um, right and yet, yeah it's 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 shocking in its mundanity, I think. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to maybe retract my Tom Clancy comparison and instead maybe go with something like the movie Heat, where it's this yeah, would be like, like if that. you had like Captain America, like with the sniper rifle covering Iron Man as he, you know, makes a trade with somebody and then <laughs> has, has to blow somebody's head off. It's it's um, it's it, like you said, it's it's that it's that moving the frame into almost a different genre that makes you kind of it kind of shocks you um with the contrast of what you're actually looking at yeah i agree yeah i I like i very much like what you said about the the mundanity of it so yeah so in this scene um taylor you know she's asking for explosives and guns and grenades from coil and she's clearly taking on a leadership role here and and even coil is just like yep whatever you need to get her it's it's (laughs) very uh encouraging this behavior yeah because i think she's the master of this and i think it has to do with her ability to multitask she can think on 
hundreds of different levels at the same time because that's what she does with her bugs. And I think it just gives her this advantage in this realm as well. Um, she's really good at it. So everyone's just kind of like clearing the way for Taylor's plan, um, a plan which she still admits is reckless, just calculated recklessness, which mm-hmm. is a hilarious term. Yeah, <laughs> that's some political doublespeak right there. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. And that's I guess we'll we'll have plenty of opportunity to point this out. But she, she at some point in there was like, yes, the key thing is to think through every aspect of the plan. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, you know, life experience has taught me that you can never think through every aspect of a plan because what gets you is the thing you didn't think of. Right. And that's, and, of course, what happens. And yeah, uh, twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so all of, all of that said, uh, Taylor did kind of take the take the reins there. But as we move into 13.6, Gru is still the battlefield commander. Yeah. And I think this ties specifically into what we were talking about before, which is like sh- Gru, I don't think is the planning guy. I think he's the executing guy. And I think he does work well with this. I think executing the plan that Taylor came up with, Gru does a nice job. So mm-hmm. when I say he's not a good leader, I mean, in specific areas, not in all areas. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a good commander. He's a bad manager. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 So the joint strike force of the travelers and undersiders is arrayed on, on several building tops surrounding a region that seven of the, uh, the enemy, seven of the nine are, are strolling through. So the nine are just strolling down the street, just killing everybody in their path that they run into. Um, it's, it's, kind of sickening and uh yeah it, it, I, I remember this being for, for whatever reason i remember the first time reading this and just being like oh my god <laughs> yeah and it's really tough too because like it, it's hard to argue with the line of thought that says the best chance for preventing more death is to let them do this until your plan is executed right but being able to sit and watch people die is a whole different thing mm-hmm. um and, and i kind of wonder if they were in Taylor's territory and she was watching her people die, um, what her reaction to this would have been, if it would have been different or not. Yeah. I bet it would have actually. Yeah. For for some reason I'm reminded of, of the first, you know, on-screen death in this, in the story, um, by, by Bakada and how that was kind of shocking. And now we have Jack (laughs) just like, like literally like laughing to himself as he, as he like slices people apart from a hundred feet away. And, and it's just, it's kind of just in the background, literally. Escalation, man. That's what we're yeah. doing. Yep. Um, yeah, so everybody is set up on these rooftops in kind of an ambush configuration. We don't really know exactly what the plan is yet, which we've learned by this point in Worm is actually the most fun way to proceed because then we get to see things evolve and, and things things are doled out to us at the right time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the dogs are loaded with containers of something. We're not sure what. And we see that the nine are heading into Dolltown, which is what they're calling Parian's territory. Yeah, she's my favorite stuffed animal lady. Um, I like that she's got a reputation now in her section of the city. Um, even though she's very anti-fighting, she's going to protect her family and her territory. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder if her and Flechette are dating yet. We haven't seen them together in a long time. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We haven't even seen any hints. So just at the worst possible second, uh, Ballistic chickens out and refuses to obliterate Cherish with a missile, which was his job. And I think. This ties into uh, Rachel's whole words versus actions thing, um, because it's very easy to say you'd be willing to get down and dirty to get a job done. But actually pressing that button, actually taking that life is a whole different thing. It's a whole different set of challenges. And you can say that you're willing to do it uh, all day long, but doing it is considerably harder. Yeah. Yeah. I thought how, how that how that sequence evolved was really interesting because ballistics like I can't do it. She's a person. She has feelings. and and Alec, who is her brother, is like, no, no, look, she's really bad. Just kill her. Yeah. And and, and then Trickster is the one who's like, fine, fine, I'll do it myself, which is a pretty interesting and revelatory character beat for Trickster, I think. Yeah. And Ballistic. So, I mean, it's very interesting yeah. to see that. Right. Yeah. Because we learn, actually, that he's a lot more like Sundancer, maybe. Yeah. So so because of this uh, failure, basically, um, Sundancer uses, uses her son to try to cut off the nine um, while Trickster uses his teleported to teleportation trickery and uh, ends up shooting Cherish with a sniper rifle. Um, 
Taylor lies to Sundancer and tells her that there are no bystanders uh, as she's using her son. Yeah, um, this is a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. And it, Taylor's in full whatever it takes mode at this point. And again, I'm going to ask a question which we don't really know the answer to, but I'm wondering if she's able to rationalize this because she's not the one directly doing the harm. She's just ordering someone else to do it. Like, if this were Taylor's giant sun orb thing, would she still be able to make that same decision? And I kind of think no. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I think she's almost so caught up in the moment here that I'm not sure if she's reflecting fully on uh, the ramifications of what she's doing. I don't know. It's 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 really really interesting because we've gone from, you know, we've seen her go from leaving a man to die, to now basically essentially sacrificing people for the sake of what she has deemed to be a more important goal, which is, yeah. you know, killing these bad guys who are probably going to kill way more people. It's that trolley problem, Matt. Yeah. The right. trolley problem it's keeps trolley, coming back. Trolley, trolley problem again. I mean, and, and we're, we're not even saying here that she's making the wrong choice. I think we're just, we're just marking this as yet another step. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what the right choice is here. I, I don't know. And I think, It would be very hard for me personally to do this, but I think she is able to make that choice and maybe that will save more people in the end. It's just tough to know. It's tough to know those things when you make those decisions. Right. Yeah. This is why I could never be president, Scott. I could never just be like, yeah, um, there's a lot of uncertainties, but you should probably just bomb those guys anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they they hope, you know, you have a moment of hope that that uh, Sundancer's son killed jack and bonesaw but it turns out that siberian had basically like grabbed both of them and extended her invincibility to them before it could uh before it could burn them um and then of course this doesn't stop her from going on the offensive while holding them um so crawler is going after Gru, who's on a separate rooftop and uh fairly awesomely trickster just keeps teleporting him and swapping him with trucks on the street level so he just keeps getting reset back to the street level every time he gets close to the top in the midst of all this death and destruction and stuff i cracked up laughing at this it's like yeah. every time trickster just uses power just to annoy the shit out of people it makes me laugh yes i never get tired of this it's really great so they finally open the cases that the dogs are carrying which turn out to contain racks and there are there are mannequins that is normal mannequins not supervillain mannequins strung up on the racks uh which are going to serve some purpose skitter lures shatterbird in using bugs and basically taunting her with the bugs and guru provides a cover of darkness to confuse matters and then eventually um trickster teleports guru and ballistic into the mannequin rack basically swapping them with the mannequins um and and then does the same with himself and regent so now all 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 of the relevant players are on the same rooftop and then trickster remote detonates the rooftops that they had been standing on and he seems to really enjoy doing so did we make sure those buildings were like (laughs) empty i never saw a line about that yeah probably you know all right she's got her bugs she knows man of steel Look, it doesn't matter, Scott. <laughs> That's the point. So um, Gru volunteers for the risky part of the plan now, which is to use himself as a body swap for Shatterbird. So the idea is um, Shatterbird shows up, and then Gru jumps out of the air, and then they swap. Uh, uh, Trickster swaps him with Shatterbird. So now Shatterbird is right in front of them, And then Regent throws her off using his power, which basically causes her to kind of crash down to ground level. And uh, Gru ends up landing on a rooftop painfully because he can't fly. And Genesis is waiting for Shatterbird down in the uh, alley and swallows her up into this sumo wrestler form that she has. (laughs) Where the fuck does Wild Bull come up with this stuff? (laughs) Sumo eat person, man. Yeah, Uh, for some reason, uh, I, I feel like I feel like I could perfectly draw this this sumo cartoon person, which, which yeah, is I have, I have a very described. I have a very clear image of it. It's just kind of crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah. Just the, all of the Genesis things are like. I wonder how long that took him to think of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we didn't even talk about the slug rabbit fire hose thing. Yeah. Right. Right. So at some point, they also scoop up 
cherish. Um, and so they returned to Coyle's base with uh, with these prisoners, covering their retreat with Skitter's uh, swarm clone decoys. And along the way, Genesis, um, yeah, Genesis grabs Cherish. Yeah, so Matt, overall, what did you think of this plan? Because I, I think on one level, it's pretty clever, um, but it, it required civilian sacrifices. Like, it, it, I just, like, it seems very reckless, and it seems like they got pretty lucky, but it was also really well thought out and well executed. Yeah, yeah, it's it's... It's always difficult to say because it mostly worked with one major failure that we're about to get to. <laughs> um, so I guess it wasn't actually that great of a plan, all things considered, cons- since that was a pretty bad, uh, bad loss actually that we're that we're about to get to. Um, but they did they did capture two of the nine, so that that ends up being really impressive to other people later. Um, clearly they they synergized a lot of their abilities which i think was i mean i guess the the thing that's good about the plan is that is that taylor is able to sit back and integrate all of these various intricately complex powers and come up with something that can one up someone as strong as shatterbird for example and and you know capture her and and totally neutralize her yeah i think the way that it integrates just about every single person's power um, you're right is, is is great and i think i think we're kind of supposed to be awed by the plan as well as kind of uncomfortable with just the the reckless audacity of it as well um and i think that's that's intentional so i think i feel the way i should feel about this plan which is like hey that was pretty cool but also you got lucky as shit because it could have gone wrong in a thousand different ways yeah and in fact did i i, I like the moment when um when Jack is is on the street, just like looking up and laughing, basically, or or, or at least grinning, because yeah, yeah, because from his point of view, it's like there's just all kinds of crazy stuff happening above him, and a fireball chasing people around, and and things teleporting this way and that way, and uh, he, and and he, basically, it's all entertainment for him. So from Jack's point of view, it was a good plan. <laughs> well, that's that's good. That's what you want when you develop a plan that one that your villain, your your opponent enjoys. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, great. Exa- yeah, exactly. So yeah, so um, they they put they they go back to Coil's base and they put Shatterbird in a special cage that contains her power and give Regent some time to work on taking her over. And Brooks is back, and yep. uh, he's ready to help make sure that uh, that Shatterbird doesn't die because. Taylor is now just fucking stinging people with crazy brown recluse spiders. And yeah, it's just, going to kill people. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. I, yeah, <laughs> she she's gonna die if you don't do something. Sorry. Yeah. So they also discuss at this point just executing Cherish because she's actually a huge risk to have around, and Taylor washes her hands of this yeah this is really interesting because we have just talking over and over again how taylor has to act how she's just constantly active she needs to be the one making the choices and here she chooses to not make the choice um and i think this is very clearly like because she didn't she's so concerned with saying or doing anything that makes coil even remotely disappointed in her um so she has to do it that way yeah yeah right yeah, I, I'm 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 genuinely unsure about the moral dimensions of what's what's happening in, in a scene like this, because for, for yeah. my like touchstone is always like Osama bin Laden. I know I know nobody who was upset when when Osama bin Laden was killed, nor anyone who was like, we should have captured him and given him a fair trial. Um. So clearly, like there, <laughs> clearly there exist people for which there is such a level of um, socially um, um, sanctioned uh, condemnation that it is literally okay to murder them. Like that's that is just the true fact about yeah. reality. Yeah. But but I'm like, okay, but am I fully comfortable with the fact that everyone's just applying this to this like 16 year old girl who has this has superpowers um cherish specifically um and it, i don't know it's it's she's definitely horrible she's definitely a monster um well it doesn't quite sit right with me though especially when you have them in custody right like i understand yeah. the risk like but to go back to osama bin laden like if we had captured him in 
uh, that raid and then just shot him in the head um, after we had him in custody because we felt like it um, without going through any kind of formal channel. I think I would have had a, a problem with that now. Um, mm-hmm. Him getting shot in the middle of the raid, like we will never know actually what happened there. But I, I don't know. It just feels weird when you have someone who surrendered in your custody and then you're just like casually talking about just executing them. Um, there's something about that that rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, and, and it's additionally interesting later on that the heroes, it really kind of says something about, you know, this world that even later the heroes are like, whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a kill order just. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that, though. It's, there's no there's no easy answer here. There's yeah. there's none. And it's almost like exhausting just to try and trying to figure out how I personally feel about this. Yeah, totally. Yeah. This is one of the this is one of the few moments in the story where I do get actually bogged down in the morality of it rather than just being like, that's interesting. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, Coyle, Coyle at this point admits that Taylor's performance has been, quote, exemplary, which gives her a lot of hope regarding um, Dinah getting out eventually. Yeah. And I think when she said, I wash my hands of this, this is kind of the exact response that she was going for. Um, and I just like, I just want to be like, Taylor, like, he's not going to let her go. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do when you know this on some level, but like, you're just, you have to, like, she can't not try. Um, and yeah, it's she's just, yeah, oh, it's sad. She's kind of backed herself into this corner where she really has to believe that Coil is going to let her go. Like that's, she, she, the other options are kind of unthinkable to her. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, she knows she doesn't have the ability to take him down and, mm-hmm she can't live with herself if this kid remains uh, captured. But so yeah, it's like, what other choice does she have? Right. So Tattletail takes off, cherishes bomb collar using her abilities. Um, and at this point, Cherish reveals to them what we haven't told you yet, which is that the nine have captured Gru. Um, and Imp, I think. I don't know if she tells them that, though. I don't think she tells them that at that time. But, but. yeah. Um, and uh, and that obviously they won't be accepting a prisoner exchange. Yeah. And of course, now the reason that the plan seemed so great is because if, in order for it to work, they had to sacrifice one of their own members, basically, um, yeah. which I don't know about you uh, is not a fair trade. Right. And and this this really worked on me. I, I remember clearly the first time I read this feeling like a legitimate sinking feeling in my gut of, of like, Oh no, how did I forget about Like I felt like I'd like forgotten, you know, one of my kids or well, something. That, yeah. That's you know, the whole like, thing is it, it, it's so well written because it like plays out. Like you don't notice that no one has noticed that grew is not there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, it's just like things are happening so fast and there's so many people and there's so many decisions that are being made all at once. And it's like, Oh, yeah, no one. He hasn't been there. There's like one small beat of it where Cherish says that she met with Imp um, to strike a deal. And like Taylor thinks to herself, oh, Gru's going to be mad about that when he gets back. And mm-hmm. that's like the only little tiny beat you have to remind yourself that he's not there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, yeah, it, it it drops on you like a hammer. And it's God, it's like, oh, yeah. shit. And especially knowing what who Bonesaw is and what she does to people like my mind was going places. Mm-hmm. Turns out the places that it went was not sufficient <laughs> to, right. to, to what actually happens, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're, we're, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not as creative as well, though. I admit that. So, um, 13.7, we're, we're moving on with, um, with this in, interrogation of cherish. So she offers to trade info on imp for her freedom. Um, and offers to help with Gru in exchange for a billion dollars which I'm not even sure if she's making that offer seriously or not. I, 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 I thought it yeah. was in t- a number intentionally so high that it, there was no seriousness behind it. Yeah. But, I think the point was just like, I know you're not going to actually yeah. give me anything I want. So yeah. yeah. Um, and and th- this is a very interesting uh, chapter and the scene in particular, because um, um, in a number of ways, but one of them is that for the first time, I think somebody's trying to out tattletale tattletale. Um, and I think Cherish does actually get under her skin and, and gets under a few different people's skin actually by doing this kind of, uh, cold reading slash use of her, of her power, uh, to, to know people's weaknesses. Um, 
but her reads do yeah they, they come from a very different place than tattletales do yeah yeah and we get to we get a little bit of information on on tattletale like she was part of an upper middle class rich family and left for some reason and we don't know what that is and i'm hoping that my guess is right still um i still like i don't know i just like i felt like we were so close to getting some information and then we just move on and i'm like ah yeah yeah she, i mean she I, I i kind of feel like she probably is getting under uh telltale skin but telltale doesn't really give her anything um she definitely gets under skater's skin though yeah um, yeah, so so Taylor proposes stashing her way out on the water where her power can't really affect anyone because there's there's no one out there and there's no boats out there. Um, uh, so so they they do they plan to do that and they plan to set up like a suicide switch where instead of being attached to a bomb, it'll just be attached to a system that will tell the nine where to find her if it if uh, if it if anything happens to the to to our you know our characters. And that's um, really and, the only thing that gets her scared mm-hmm. um the yeah. idea of dying uh-uh. it's yeah. it's the rest of the nine finding her right because she knows they have a fate worse than death planned for her yeah so yeah he she, she's going after everybody you know she's she's uh going after homes uh, after a uh, trickster feeling homesick trickster scared little boy pretending to be a leader it's your fault you know she blames you everyone does they're even starting to hate you and and then she's and then she's basically <laughs> sowing division and, and saying, your boss is screwing you, all of you. You have no idea how badly your cogs in his, in his machine and he's only steps away from pulling it all together. Get rid of the nine stage, the final play with everyone in their proper spots. And then he, then he doesn't need you anymore. Um, and, and, and then, you know, finally, he, he, she, she basically says, um, basically, basically says, Skitter, he's never going to let go of whoever it is that you want him to let go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I love this um, because kind of like Tattletale, Cherish could be bullshitting here. Like Mm -hmm. she she has the ability, like she can read Taylor and know that this is like Taylor's driving force right now. Like the thing that defines her is her wanting to save Dinah. So like, of course, that is going to be layered in every emotion that she has right now. So it's very easy to detect that. And you could just bullshit it i mean in the, in that case i don't think that she is because i think obviously coil is not going to let dinah go and everyone kind of knows it but like it, it's it's very similar to how tattletale can use her power to manipulate people it's, it, it is a very similar thing and it's coming from a different place but like who knows where she's lying and where she's just using people's insecurities and fears against them to manipulate them yeah, and one thing that Cherish has that Tattletale doesn't is Cherish knows when she's right because she can instantly see whether the right. whether the person is is resonating with what she's saying or not. Yeah, yeah. So it obviously gets under Skitter's skin because Skitter quote kicks her in the head once more for good measure after she uh, after she says this. <laughs> yeah, and I I love that. It's like a really like badass, but like mean line is like i hope i hope bon- bone saw reinforced your teeth before she mm-hmm. kicks her in the face right and it's like and then there's like this moment like she she did <laughs> it's yeah. like, her teeth don't break that's like yeah jesus which is actually plot relevant yeah so um so so at this point skitter has kind of a a plan to go try to get the protector its help so she goes with with a trickster to um basically get as close as she can to the protectorate and then she uses uses a swarm clone and a camera and parks it at their front door um and the protectorate guys come out to talk and uh she offers to give cherish to the protectorate in exchange for help rescuing Gru. and the heroic miss militia as as we just mentioned is also quite practical and says put a bullet in her skull and be done with it there's a kill order on them yeah and this again this is tough for me in, in what we were talking about before, because on the one hand, like they are represent, they represent the government. So the government has like the bilateral authority to make those decisions. Whereas a, a single person doesn't. So like it, it doesn't, it's not heroic, but like they have the authority to make that call. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm partially okay. I don't know. Like I can't, I can't come down on the side with this. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not gonna. Yeah. I think we've, I think we've expressed our, uh, complete, uh, 
lack of moral clarity here and and uh, we're gonna have to go meditate on this <laughs> so yeah the protectorate is not willing to stick out their necks and risk their own people especially teaming up with villains who, notorious villains who they don't trust um and and legend kind of kind of verbally goes after taylor and is like who are you and and you know what's going on and taylor admits to legend that there's someone specific she wants to help and that this is all for them yeah and i think it's it's kind of very easy to just write off the good guys here and say like you're lazy you're good for nothing you're not going to help um but on the other hand like if you look at it from their perspective like this villain just shows up and says work with us here we have this person for you trust us um you can't you can't blame them for not buying it so i, I don't know like it's just i i I know we're trying to paint the the authority figures here in a bad light again because they're not willing to help. But on the other hand, like I get it. Yeah, right. It's it's all very understandable here. I mean, because they're, you know, like you said, they're, they're they're kind of the government and they're kind of the police, and their hands are tied in a lot of ways that that skitters are not. And, yeah. and and Taylor does not tend to do perspective taking very well. So she's not exactly, you know, we're, we're in her head. So we're not, she's not going out of her way to be like, well, I, I understand that they're under a lot of constraints. She's just like idiots. So <laughs> yeah. So she gives a speech about gray morality and says, there are no simple answers. And, and legend goes, there can be, you can do what's right, which is, and it, first of all, contrasts directly with Taylor earlier saying to Panacea, sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. Um, and and also, and, and then she thinks immediately after this, I was getting an inkling of what Bitch referred to as words, um, <laughs> which which made me laugh. I love this so much. And like the thing with me is I really want to be on Legend's side here. I, I like Legend a lot. I think he seems so far like a, a really decent, well-meaning guy who's just trying to do what's right. But what is right in this situation? Like, what does doing what's right mean in the context of fighting the Slaughterhouse Nine? Like, it, it's really easy to sit there and, and say, um, I'm going to stand up for what's right and do the right thing and be above it all. But what does that mean in actual doing it, in actual mm -hmm. action? And, like... Like a legend means well, and he's trying to to do good here, but like it's just it's nothing. It it's meaningless, and it, like it it doesn't solve any actual situation. It doesn't solve any actual problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's I think legend is operating from a kind of a highly privileged position in terms of the challenges that he is entitled to face. Like he he's someone who who fights you know inbringers, and it's like. What's the right choice here? Oh, you you save as many people as you can, and you do as much damage mm -hmm. to the bringers as you can. And I mean, obviously, I'm simplifying. He probably has all kinds of different missions, but like Taylor is this young kid with all these like conflicting loyalties and and conflicting needs and and personal stakes of various sorts. And it's genuinely not easy to just be like, what is the right thing to do here? And and every every young person gets this, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe easier than older people, actually. And, and I mean, you could argue that the right thing to do here is to attack the Slaughterhouse Nine. I mean, yeah. th like so like I just like I, like Taylor is is talking about how gray morality is and which, of course, she's she's right. She's absolutely right. And it's very wise for a kid to be on this. And then like legend just comes back with this like meaningless diatribe about, mm -hmm. um, well, you you could do what's right. And it's mm -hmm. just like, it doesn't serve any purpose. It's not helpful. It doesn't do anything. And I'm just like, dude, like, I understand your, your, I understand the, the, the goal behind it. And I think those words are important, but at the end of the day, they are just words and they don't stop eight super powered psycho monsters. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the same page with you there. It's, it's very interesting dynamic there. So we also learn here that arms master escaped from custody uh, which is obviously relevant because he better not try to escape the city or they're going to use the bioweapon. Yeah, and I don't think he will. I think Arms Master and Dragon have run off with each other. And uh, I I'm going to make a prediction here, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's going to come back with Dragon during uh, the final fight and he's going to wreck some shit. Um, and I think he's going to fight off his demons focused in on the Slaughterhouse Nine. 
And then I think there's going to be some fun moments of conflict between Skitter and him because that's too delicious to ignore. <laughs> and then uh, I think he's going to run away with Dragon. I think he'll be back, but I think he's going to run away with Dragon after that and uh, maybe hunt out some Dragon Slayers. That'd be cool. All right. So this is it's great. I'm going to write all these down. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so into this chapter, the heroes have proven useless, uh, but Trickster finally has an idea. Oh, good. I'm sure this will be a rational, um, well thought out, great idea. Yeah, it will have it, just like the last plan. It will it will go off without a hitch. <laughs> so we move into thirteen point eight, and we're we're uh, in. You know, we've we've essentially begun implementing Trickster's plan. The villains are all heading out from Coyle's base in a trio of trucks. Taylor retreats into her headspace. Uh, she's under a lot of stress. She's thinking about what Brian could be undergoing, what's going on with the travelers. She's naming her ninja jutsus to herself. Yeah, I, I like this a lot because, like, she has this realization when she sees uh, Trickster, like, light up a cigarette, and he's like, oh, that's what he uses to calm down on my stress. What do I do? Well... I go into my head and I think about every single thing that's stressing me out and I let it stress me out even further. And that's how I handle my stress. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. That's what people mean when they say that Taylor's head is an intense place to be. Yeah. So they arrive at, um, the building that they know the nine are in, uh, Regent is there. And so is Shatterbird under his control. So they have a pretty powerful weapon on their side, actually. Um, but he's finding her power very difficult to use. It's not at all natural to him. And, uh, she's also really, really angry because she's a control freak. And so he's having more difficulty than usual, keeping her under control. Yeah. I like, I like the, the, the detail behind that. Yeah. Uh, I still like, I still find just Regent's power just disturbing on every level, even when it's used on terrible monster people, but like, it's still disquieting for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find that using it on Shatterbird doesn't bother me so much, but uh, I, I uh... yeah, okay. So, yeah, so inside the buildings, Taylor's using her sensory power with the bugs, and she finds that there are indeed lots of innocents, and Taylor argues that they be given a chance to escape before the attack commences, but the others want to just proceed with the plan. Um, I like this little bit from her where she says, the ends justify the means. You realize that when this when this all goes down, they're going to die, almost guaranteed. And then she thinks to herself, I directed Sundancer to attack a group of people who included bystanders, but they had been goners already, dead for all intents and purposes. This was something else. I wanted to play a copy of the Alanis Morissette's ironic song here, but uh -huh. I figured we'd be content flagged. Yeah. So, But this is like rain on your wedding day. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. This is hilarious, ironic because Taylor Taylor's mo is the ends justify the means. She's been doing that uh, literally this entire book, and then uh, someone else does it, and she's like, "What? You can't do yeah. that!" Right, and and then reflects on the last time that she did that, but then explains to herself <laughs> how that wasn't the same thing. Oh yeah, but that was different. This is totally different. Yeah, um, this yeah. is wrong this time because right. I say it is because I'm Taylor. Yeah, literally thinks this was something else. Like, was it Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> and so. again, she might be right here. I'm not saying that she's wrong, but like, it's just very interesting to look at how her mind deals with these things and how she processes them yeah. and what oh. what is too far for her and what is completely fine and understandable. And and this is all totally like psychologically realistic to me, by yeah. the way. I mean, yeah. like this feels so authentic to like. When, when, when you catch yourself doing any kind of like self-justification, which every person does at one point or another, um, these are the exact little mental maneuvers that you're doing. You're doing this like, oh, that what I'm doing is different from that, even though it's the same thing. So, yeah. Yep. Especially uh, uh, teenagers. Like, yes. that's like, I mean, it, we sometimes we forget that Taylor is a child, but Taylor is a teenager. She does not have a fully formed brain yet. Um, <laughs> and she is. She's trying, she's doing the best she can, but yep. uh, this is, this is hilariously ironic. Yeah. So it kind of forces their hand because Purity and, and her gang arrive uh, and Shatterbird and Genesis 
taking on a crawler like form head out to duke it out with the pure and this was apparently this arrival of the pure was apparently part of the plan <laughs> is this the time where i mentioned that this plan is really stupid brian's captured for one plan and then this is the shit that they come up with so let's yeah. let's break this down um we're gonna bring more bad guys to fight to the bad guy fight um and fight those other bad guys which will, will hopefully draw out the even more bad guys um so to fight all those bad guys so that those bad guys are distracted by fighting each other we can slip in and steal back our bad guy without any of the other bad guys noticing yes brilliant yes i mean that's how i would have planned it myself personally <laughs> it's a stupid plan it's so stupid so using this distraction um Taylor, uses her bugs to guide as many civilians as possible away um, and, and looking for Gru. Uh, she finds lots more civilians. She finds one of Parian's dolls, um, but no Gru anywhere. She does find a few closed off areas that she can't get into with her bugs. But she And she kind of figures, well, like he, he must be in one of those. So Taylor asks Regent to draw Purity's fire toward the building containing the Nine, hoping to sort of nudge them out which incidentally is the one point where she actually has conflict with alec because alec snaps at her not to distract him uh and then the nine respond by driving all the civilians out of the building ahead of them and we see that the civilians have been modified surgically to look like members of the nine and serve as decoys man so um this is our first hint that we're going straight back to horror movie again um mm -hmm. And yeah, this is disturbing. I mean, like to take innocent people and make them look like some of the scariest people on the planet um, is cruel. And like when when Bonesaw talks about it later, when she's like, think of how many surgeries it'll take to get them even close to back to what they normally look like. And it's just yeah. like, Jesus Christ, like this is right. awful. Well, and also she's done stuff like shorten their limbs yeah. to make them more her height. Right, right. You're not going to fix that. No. And, and, and this is like. This is the uh, the appetizer for the horror that we're going to see in the rest of this stuff. So this is yeah. this is just setting us up for it. Yeah, no, I, I remember this. This this be, this is rapidly becoming super, super disturbing. And I remember the first time I read this, just I, I don't remember if I actually like had to put it down for a while after this. <laughs> but but it feels like the kind of thing where you just be like overwhelmed with the just like gut churning horror of it yeah yeah so so anyway skitter tattletail trickster and sundancer and ballistic uh teleport inside and inside is the set of a horror movie as you said yeah and i think wild Bo, like his prose here like really steps it up and goes into high gear like from now on the way that things are explained and how how like textual it is while they're in this house is just great like almost the first line is like Taylor saying they were smells I've gotten to know since Leviathan's attack. Blood, death, and the dank smell of sweat. And it's just like you're there. You're you're there mm -hmm. instantly. And man, I don't like being there. Yep. So yeah, um, the, they they're they're walking through this horrible environment, um, which really, like you said, very very um, immersive writing. And they're gradually checking all all the closed up locations that Skitter wasn't able to probe with bugs. Um, and everyone's getting increasingly tense and unnerved. And then they find Brian in a walk-in freezer. And uh, I'm not going to quote the whole thing. So, but, but basically, he, his, his, his organs, his, like his body has been splayed open and partially flayed. And his organs have been removed and are basically just kind of placed all around him in various chassis. Um, and of course, he's awake and looks up at them as they walk in. And it said, it says, and this, I'm quoting this part because it's like the saddest part to me, where it says, his head was untouched. He looked up at us and he looked harrowed. The look in his eyes was more animal than person. His pupils mere pinpoints in his brown eyes. Tiny beads of sweat dotted the skin of his face, no doubt due to the warmth of the room. But he was shivering. Oh, my voice was a croak. Brian. Um, and, and they can't even enter the room because his nerves have been artificially extended and glued all over the floor. So they can't even walk in there. And the most pathetic thing to me is that he can't even speak. 
Yeah, this uh, this is like it's hard to talk about. Like this is yeah. horrific. This is like Cronenbergian level horror. Um, and this is Brian. Like this is like this. We've seen a lot of death and destruction, but I don't think we've ever really seen it so close to home for our characters. And this is like it's like it was so it was so tough to read and like just the, the oh Brian like that that just like that's all she can say in that moment it's just like ah oh, it's yeah. terrible I mean just just to isolate that one bit of technique she's so careful about using cape names when when everyone's in costume and and when they're doing cape stuff yeah and she just it just slips out that she and she calls him Brian not only this time but several more times yeah because he's Brian to her right now. Um, yeah, th- this, this is the first time in this whole project actually that I've thought to myself while making our show notes, like I might have trouble reading this part out loud. Um, because it, it really bears emphasis that this was a really emotionally impactful scene for me. Um, the first time and, and like it still gets me on rereads actually. Like I have, I have favorite books and favorite movies that don't actually affect me as much as this scene affects me. Um, and this is just one scene out of this story. So yeah, this really bears a lot of underlines. Uh, this moment does. I, I completely agree with you. I, I think it, it like, and it lands with the emotionality it needs to like, it. it's just the setup of it, how we're like slowly ramping up to this, this reveal. Um, it's just, it's, it's perfectly executed. It just, it hits you exactly the way it needs to and then it just keeps going from there yeah yeah right it, it's not it's not like that was the the moment and then it's resolved and they save him it gets it gets worse yeah so the kind-hearted ballistic offers on the spot pretty much to put Gru down put him out of his misery um skitter says no uh, she's she's completely desperate to save him and lisa actually argues for euthanizing him um, and the two of them come as close to fighting as they ever have in the story. Yeah. And, and as much as I love Brian, Taylor is on the wrong side of this argument. Like what, what is being done to hear him here is so far beyond cruel that like, like it, he's, it's terrible. Like it's awful. Like I can't, I can't even come up with the words mm-hmm. and, and for her to like, selfishly make this unilateral decision for the whole team for brian himself that no we are not going to save him from or spare him from this work even if it means i'm willing for him to suffer if it means there's a chance we can help him and that like that comes off to me as so selfish like it like it wouldn't seem like it would but it, it just it seems like she's thinking about herself and her like how she can't lose him she's not thinking about brian in this moment yeah, and and I think like we pointed out many times, it's it's like if if she sees something as as right, there's no budging her. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, using her sensory power as this is all happening, she's watching the nine make their way into the streets, um, and they're searching the building for Bone Saw because basically Skitter's idea now is like we have to find Bone Saw. First, she said we have to find Panacea to fix him, and they're like, we we probably aren't going to find her. Yeah, that's completely unreasonable. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, well, he just hangs out here, uh, and then they're like, okay, we're going to find Bone Saw and make Bone Saw fix him, which I'm sure Gru would totally invite right now. It would be would be to have Bone Saw work on him some more. <laughs> uh... So, so they finally find Bone Saw, but it turns out that it's actually a decoy, and the actual Bone Saw was hiding and got the drop on them and darted everyone with a paralytic dart. And and basically puts everyone out of commission except Skitter, who has her armor. Um, but the spider robots r- quickly sees her, and Bonesaw blows some dust in her face that disables her power. So the robots drag everyone back to where Gru is and stack them like logs. And uh, at the end of this chapter, Taylor notices that Imp is also in the pile with them. So uh, yeah, I don't I don't think we knew that Imp was caught yet. Actually, no, we did not. You're right. That was the reveal. Um, yeah. Hey, hey, Matt. This mm-hmm. plan, it's looking, it's looking pretty yeah. great. Go, yeah, I'm sure Trickster's, yeah, Trick, Trickster's feeling top of his game right now. <laughs> so 13.9 opens, and uh, things do not get less intense. So Bonesaw is preparing to vivisect Skitter specifically because she's very interested in Skitter's brain because of uh, 
basically how Skater is still able to sort of use her power, even though she shouldn't be able to use her power with the drug that, that Bonesaw gave her. Um, but Skater's commands are like really coarse and almost useless in terms of actually doing anything in this in this moment. Yeah, and Bonesaw like casually singing like the neck bone is connected to the hip bone and mm -hmm. like all these other bones that are definitely not connected to each other <laughs> is just the most horrifying thing ever. Yeah. Oh yeah. god. Right. I this is so masterful. Yeah. So yeah. So Bonesaw at this moment drops some more powers science on us, mentioning the existence of the brain area known as the Corona Palencia, which is the part of the brain that's used to manage powers. So Bonesaw likes to modify people's brains and thus modify their powers. And she says that she can pry it open and she can make it so it can't be turned off. She can disable it. She can... It's, it's kind of unspecified what she can do, actually, but it seems that she can do quite a bit by manipulating brains. Um, she also says if you carve out the corona, the powers still work. They just can't be controlled. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I think she talks about, she mentions the, the passenger. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. In, in that quote, and um, so yeah. I, this, <laughs> here's the thing, I, People ask me a lot um, to speculate more on like the source of the powers and like we keep getting all this little bits of information and what it means. Um, and, and and like part of me. So this is going to sound bad, but part of me doesn't care. Um, and, and like I think the source of the powers are a key plot point and I'm very interested in all that. But the specific like science fiction esque details of how all this stuff works, like I'm only interested in that up until the point where how it relates to the characters and what it means for the characters. And I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think that's kind of where you and I differentiate in a lot of this stuff. Like you read a lot of like very hard science fiction um, and you like knowing the science behind all this stuff. Um, and I'm not as interested in that stuff. Am I, am I completely off base here? No, I, I mean, I think that's, that's probably fair. I mean, I, there's, I, I love m many, many things about Worm, but but I think you, you knew from the beginning of this, fr from that from that review that I wrote, that like w one of the things that I chose to to highlight as being exemplary was that there was an actual explanation for powers that wasn't just like oh it's the mutant gene, which makes no sense. Yeah, and 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 don't get me wrong, like I, I like I said, I like it how it like relates to the character. So like. I'm less interested in what a passenger quote unquote is and more interested in how that affects and interacts with our main character. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to get there. I mean, I think this is, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just, I'm just trying to explain why people like, I, I just see people on the, the Reddit thread a lot. It's like speculate more on what exactly how the powers work and what do you think? And, and the reason I'm not doing that is because that's not like at the forefront of my concern when I'm reading this stuff. Um, and so that's, that's all I was trying to say with that. Yeah. I mean, what's really interesting to me consistently is that you're, you're able to make, um, predictions that are rooted more in like thematic and, and dramatic reasoning rather than like, um, down in the weeds, like like within world analytic predictions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm communicating that right, but it's like, I think so. It's, it's the difference between someone who like thinks about the themes of a work and concludes the probable directions of the work based on what the author seems to be trying to say versus like a theory crafting person. And I love both of those things is the yeah. thing. I mean, I, I spend tons of time doing theory crafting on various <laughs> fandom websites and stuff, but, but, but yeah, I'm, I mean, most of what I think we're doing on this podcast is 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 the, like the thematic uh, right. and, and kind of more like structural analytic type stuff. And, and I want to be clear that I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that kind of theory crafting. Like I know there are probably tons of Worm fans that love to get down into the details. I am less concerned with that. I like you said, I'm more concerned with the themes and how it relates narratively to it. Um, and that's why you're not seeing like that's why when people ask me to like predict. Like you hear someone's name, predict what their power is. Um, like I'm less concerned with that. Like, if, like unless it's like their name predicts what their power predicts, with, like who their character is. Like I'm, I guess 
I, I think I'm doing a bad job of explaining this, but I'm just trying to, to get across like why some of this theory crafting stuff that people like, I'm seemingly more indifferent to it. And it's just because that's not how I approach works of, of fiction. Um, and it's totally cool that other people do it that way. I wish I could get into the weeds with some of you guys on that kind of stuff, but that's just not what interests me. Um, that, and that's all I was trying to say. Yeah, I, I think you I think you got it across. OK, but I will say um, if you want me to make a speculation on what the passengers are, um, uh, they're presumably the remnant pieces of whatever that giant being that was that separated from its buddy and targeted uh, that specific Earth. Um, I think th they might be dead, but I still think my prediction is that they're still affecting behavior in capes. And I think that's why we see this level of powers are always used toward fighting and violence is because of this thing that's that's directing people so that's my my speculation on that okay all righty well let's move on with this delightful bag of fun yeah that was a big tangent i'm sorry i think i think it was a good tangent though so so uh bonesaw slices taylor's forehead open with the scalpel and kisses the bloody wound and then starts up a circular saw ready to get into Taylor's head. The saw jams, so she goes to get another one. And while she's just laying there paralyzed, Skidder's playing, praying for a rescuer, and she senses one arrive as one of Perrin's dolls starts moving around inside the building, but it doesn't quite arrive yet. Um, so Skidder distracts Bonesaw with some confusing eye blinks while the doll approaches. So I... I I'm not going to read all of this, but I, I pulled out all these quotes of, of all of the things that Bonesaw plans to do to Skitter, basically describing the kind of like hacks, uh, hack job like being that she's going to make Taylor into, which is just such a horrible like thing that I can't even... I don't even know how you think of this. Yeah, and the thing that is so remarkable about this, I, this, I think, is that I didn't ever think that this was actually going to happen to her, but it almost didn't matter. Like in, mm -hmm. in the moment, like the descriptions are so vivid and like fundamentally horrifying, like on this, this deep, disturbing body horror level mm -hmm. um, that it didn't matter if I knew or thought if it was going to happen or not. It's just like in my head as I read it, it was real and it just was gross and disturbing. And it was like, you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, and, and then it, it even comes to the point where Bone Saw starts sawing into her skull with the, with the circular saw, right, right. and it's like like she's hearing the horrible noise, and you're like, oh my god, it's happening, and 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 you're like, oh thank god, because the, the the Parian dinosaur doll arrives, and attacks Bone Saw, um, but uh, but but just, you know it, it like bangs her up a little bit, but she's so resilient, um, the uh, the mecha spiders are able to kind of cut through it enough that it finally disintegrates and and it turns out that Parian is actually fit personally inside it um inside the dinosaur and she's absolutely devastated and it's just really depressing because all these people who are who are dead in in and around the building um dead and or turned into decoys uh were were her people yeah her family like her mom and her dad and like yeah like and this is this is a person who didn't want to fight, like who was I don't want to fight. I don't want conflict. I just want to have me and my own. And they were just like s scooped up into this this war and destroyed, utterly destroyed. And it's so sad. Yeah, yeah, it's that was, that was a rough moment, too. Yeah. So so Bonesaw lures her in by pretending to be vulnerable um, and then spits acid in her face, which is where that. Bone saw's teeth are actually not breakable, comes in. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Jack shows up, perfect timing, and uh, he says it's time to go, but Bone saw does not want to go. She wants to stay and dissect all of our heroes. But Jack says she can only bring three with them, so she picks Skitter, Tattletail, and Trickster because she wants to play with their powers. And then they agree that they'll kill the others, but leave Brian alive as a demonstration, I guess. Um, and as they prepare to kill Imp, uh, uh, actually as, as Burnscar does, because she's there too, they hear Brian struggling, um, and see his visible heart hammering. Um, and, and just as Burnscar's fire begins to come out, Brian's darkness emerges and it's somehow different. 
and then Taylor is watching the two entities gliding through space, seeing various Earths, seeing possibilities, communicating with each other. Yeah, I really, I really want to gloat here because <laughs> I was right, but I also don't because this is such a like I made a joke about it on Twitter after <laughs> right after you, and it's really just me processing my horror from the whole scene so i'm like i'll be funny because if i'm not funny then i'm horrified and yeah. everyone's like how could you make light of this moment and i was like i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah. i just like, that's how i that's how i deal with things yeah sarcasm is our coping mechanism <laughs> yeah um but yeah so i um i think we're going to talk a little bit more in the speculation section about like my exact line of thought that led me to this um i was very surprised that it was correct this was a a, a more more guess than uh educated guess on any of my speculation so i was very surprised but uh this is cool kind yeah. of yeah so so w i'm gonna walk through what's happening and i actually just kind of want your your off the cuff like thoughts of like what you were feeling at the moment because i remember i remember having a very wrong impression of what was happening which i think is intentional um in terms of how the scene is written but we, we can talk about that in, in a couple minutes so so yeah so so suddenly there's another man standing there in the darkness, um, which Taylor can sense with her bugs, but no one else is aware that he's there. And then the man strides through the darkness, grabs Burnscar around the face and smashes her head through the counter, killing her instantly. Yeah. And this is like, like, and I think the, 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 the basic thing here is I thought as we were going through the second trigger event that Brian had basically become a god like a, a scion esque God. Um, and I was kind of like, my initial reaction was that's kind of lame. Like I, like it, it, like, cause if he was that powerful, I think it kind of destroys some of the coolness of the story. Um, obviously that's not what actually happens, but like in that moment, that's kind of what I was feeling. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting choice made here because Taylor, I mean, we're going to, we're going to go further, but as he keeps doing things, Taylor is misinterpreting what's happening. Yeah, she's thus... like counting his new powers. Yeah, right. So Bonesaw darts in to grab the data from the second trigger event. Um, and, and now we see the man. It looks like Brian, but black and white monochrome with colors spiraling out from his chest. The man grips Bonesaw's hands and Jack tries to cut him, but it does nothing. So he cuts off Bonesaw's hands so that she can flee. Um, at this point, after the t two remaining nine have uh, have fled, the black and white man disappears, and Brian begins to draw his body together somehow. And it takes a very long time. I think Taylor says five to ten minutes, but eventually he heals almost completely and makes his way over to his friends, crawls over to his friends, and then he heals each of them with with a different level of of power, um, and then. At the end of this, he's on all fours, weeping, and Tattletail urges Taylor to give him space and to let Imp comfort him. Um, and as they leave, Brian is clearly traumatized, and Taylor feels more helpless than ever. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we find out how he did all these things in the yeah. next chapter, but um, I have no idea who the monochrome <laughs> Brian is at all. Like, I can't, I can't, like, my, my only thing is that maybe it's, a physical manifestation of the passenger thing that uh um bonesaw was just talking about but like that's my only guess i have no idea um but i wanted to talk to you in a nerdy way about this trigger event as a whole and what it means like in the um uh, the place in the story because i think there's a tendency to call this a, a deus ex machina um but i don't i don't think it's that um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's since the idea of second trigger events has been set up and this totally fits that circumstance, I, I, I don't think that, that that fits as a description. But what we can call this is something that our boy uh, J, uh, Tolkien uh, coined way back in Lord of the Rings time, which he mm -hmm. called it a, a U catastrophe, um, which is the definition is just a sudden and favor favorable result of events in a story. Um, so basically something super good happens right out of the blue. And I don't think it perfectly fits here because obviously there's a, a lot of really fucked up things that happen here. And I think when Tolkien was talking about you catastrophe, he more meant it as just like this joyous 
good thing happens. Um, if you want to put it in Lord of the Ring context, any, every freaking time the eagles show up in any of Tolkien's work is a is a, 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 a catastrophic event. Um, and so, I, but I think it's the closest thing to what we can use to describe this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think I think that's probably a, a fair description for it. Like it, it, it I, I believe that like when Gandalf comes back and brings all the all the soldiers to Helm's Deep, I believe that qualifies as as you catastrophe. I, I may be wrong. I think. And, it, yeah, I think it does. And and the point there is that that was indeed like set up. It's just that in that moment you kind of forget that Gandalf was going to come back, and then he does, right. and you're like, yay. And I think so that's. Yeah, I think that's the main difference between that and just a, a, a deus ex is that an act of God, as it were, is literally something that has not been set up before in the story and just a, appears when you've written yourself into a corner and you need your characters to get out of it. But this was something that was set up in the past and is just a a fortunate moment of good luck for all your characters at the right time. Um, and I think it works really well here. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think it's it also qualifies as a Chekhov's gun because... I think most people, the moment they hear the the you know that there's such a thing as trigger events, they think, oh yeah, we're gonna see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it it just it happens to come into play in a way that is, um, narratively highly like crucial and and, and pivotal, not just you know, it's not a background element. Yeah, agree. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So so that's what happened there, and and now we'll move on to thirteen point. 10 and we'll we'll get a better understanding of of what just happened exactly so taylor has been sleeping and, and so so of all the other villains except for genesis who doesn't need to sleep the same way um and she she wakes up uh she checks around with her bugs and she finds that brian is is awake actually he's he's immediately acting different and i'm really want to point out here that these characters are also clear in my head that you can really read things into the smallest actions that deviate from the norm like he you know she she comes in and he says i said you can check on me in person if you want the words were kind but the look in his eyes wasn't his stare reminded me of bitch yeah i love this stuff a lot um and and i love Wild Bill uses like uh, comparative character descriptions a lot. Like he defines who a character is. And then if he needs to quickly reference what someone is acting like, he just compares to that character. And it's because his characters are so clear that he can do that. Um, and I think that ties back to uh, his efficiency as a writer. Um, and, and we get it in this moment, like his stare reminded me a bitch. We get it. Like it's, it's like lifeless. It's devoid of, of any kind of normal, facial expression reading like it, it's it's really great yeah and he's mad he's mad right yeah that, that's the, i mean i think that's another interesting thing that comes across very strongly here is that you like you, you as the reader are aware that he's like fuming and being passive aggressive well before taylor kind of recognizes it i think yeah um, and, and one of the the, the through lines that i want to make sure we keep here is that we're, we're in taylor's head for this entire uh chapter she never once thinks about how Brian is feeling during this entire chapter. She never once wonders aloud, like if he's okay, like she's worried about him physically, but like mentally doesn't seem concerned at all. Yeah. Yeah. Th th it's definitely important chapter in that regard in terms of, in terms of showing certain things about how she can be. So yeah, so before we before they start kind of getting into that though, uh, he he kind of starts by offering to show her his new power, um, but it spooks her when he reaches for her head uh, because of her recent experience regarding someone reaching for her head, and they end up awkwardly regarding each other with fear, and so they settle for him just explaining it, and he explains that his darkness now affects powers more strongly and that he can borrow the powers of people that are in his range in a less uh, less powerful form. So when he regenerated his own body, he was borrowing crawlers re regeneration. Um, and when he was helping the others to heal, he was using Othalas. And the black and white man uh, was not Genesis, though. He, 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 he knows that for a fact. Uh, he, he describes it as a hole in reality that took something out of him to feed and shape itself. Well, that just uh, clears everything up then. 
Yep. Still have no idea what that thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point in the conversation, she has to take out her contact lenses because she fell asleep with them. And of course, this effectively increases the distance between them. Yeah. Um, let's let's tie back to how she seems completely uh, unable to uh, read into his intentions at all. And let's make the metaphorical not being able to see him <laughs> into the literal cannot see him because she can't, yeah. literally can't see him. That's a really it's a really nice little beat. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's there, it, it could also be just to, to layer on the, the thematic uh things here brian's power does involve hiding and being visible and uh and things like this so and of course the power is a metaphor for his trauma so we've got lots of elements here so finally after kind of simmering for a bit brian can't hold back his anger anymore and he starts really kind of going at taylor verbally he, he berates her for risking everyone's life on the risky plan to save him he talks about how he always has to push back on her because she's insanely aggressive and she's manipulative and she counts on her ability to solve problems on the fly without planning. Um, and we kind of know he's right about all this, but he, he's triggering a lot of her, her bully trigger reactions. Yeah. Um, and it, like, it, it's not fair that this thing happened to him. So it's basically yeah, it's, it, his position is like, I, I'm the one who's trying to keep things sane and I'm and I'm the one who got captured and tortured, and and he th and he says out loud, knowing there was no way you could with your with your injury, so you let me. He stared at me with an, with an intensity that I couldn't meet. I broke eye contact, looking down at my gloved hands, which were clutched together in my lap, fingers tangled. Tell me, Taylor, if you don't deserve blame, who does? Oof. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so let's unpack all this, right? Because I think this is the central conceit of the arc coming together right here, right? Um, we've been setting up for kind of many arcs, this central uh, Brian as the cautious um, planner versus Taylor as this kind of sometimes reckless, aggressive person who always needs to act. Um, and I, I really like that you used the word bullying there because like... Taylor does kind of bully people um, like she like Lisa in the mall. She bullied her to help out with the girl. Um, she bullied everyone into saving Brian. And in the middle of that, bullied them all to let to, to forcing her to save the civilians. And then she bullies them into keeping Brian alive, even though like short of that new catastrophic event. It, like he was dead. Like mm -hmm. if that hadn't happened, he was dead. And yeah. like the book is siding with Brian here. I think you're absolutely right that the book is saying that, um, yeah, Brian was hurtful here because Brian is mad and in pain and in suffering from severe trauma, but he's not wrong. Um, Taylor's plan did get Brian captured and Brian is trying to do his best to keep these people in check. And, and this is witnessed because the first time he's not around to stop them from making a bad plan, they make a plan that gets everybody captured. <laughs> And yeah. like everyone is about to die, except Brian swoops in and saves them with this almost hand of God miracle. And mm -hmm. like, I think that's very clearly saying that, yeah, he's right. He's right, Taylor. And you need to be listening to what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, like on the one level, it, it, it's interesting because on the one level, she kind of rejects it uh, reflexively because because like I said, She's she's triggered and instead of yeah. hearing his words and accepting his criticism, which it, which is angry, it's angry criticism. So it's it's always hard to accept criticism, which is sort of scathing in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but she's she's on the one hand, like not really accepting it, but then also. She she already feels badly about herself and she feels responsible for a lot of things. So she does kind of manage to take it from that place to being like, all right, well, I'll just leave, say the word and I'll just leave the team. I, I don't deserve to be on the team anymore. You're, you're right. Um, but 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 you're right. She goes from. You're wrong to you're right, I'll leave without ever actually extending him any compassion yeah, in fact, she kind of does the opposite because there's a, a spot where she says um, a part of me wanted to sympathize and hug him and tell him it, he was OK. 
but another part of me was angry and wanted to slap him, scream at him, because he was still focused on himself, 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 after he just attacked me. And I'm like, Taylor, this isn't about you right now. Like, this guy is going through this horrible trauma. And, and like, she can't, she doesn't see that. She can't, I don't know, I don't know if she can't see it. I don't know if it's, it's because she's triggered and she can't, she can't put herself in his headspace. But, like, that's just, like, I was so disappointed in her in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I think that is it. I, I think, I mean, yeah, I guess I am disappointed in, in, in her, but I'm also just, like, sad for her because it's really obvious here how um, slave to her, her own, you know, e- emotional um volatility i guess i'm not sure what the word is exactly but just like yeah it's it's a lot of the time she's driven by these impulses that are basically her her like flinch reactions to things she perceives as bullying and sometimes they serve her well like when they cause her to save charlotte and right here they're serving her very poorly and they're they're getting between her and someone who really needs her help yeah Yeah. And like he is, he's like, he let out his madness and then he's reaching out for help. And she just, she, she, she just misses it. Right. Yeah. Cause uh, yeah, exactly. So at this point, after she says she'll leave, he actually says, I'm sorry, I'm on edge. I'm spooked. I can't calm down. I shouldn't have said what I did. Um, and, and he goes on to say, I won't lie and say I've suddenly realized I'm in love with you. I really don't know what what, uh, what I feel, so I can only comment on what I think. I can say I, I respect you on a lot, of, a lot of levels, even if I can't figure you out. Um, but Taylor's still just, like, too hurt <laughs> to, to be like, okay, you yeah. know, you were just basically tortured to death. Maybe I can extend you a bit of uh, sympathy. So So, yeah, so Taylor... Taylor goes to make tea for herself and to get him some water. And while she does this, she sends a message to the PHQ and then she heads back and watches TV with Brian. Um, Yeah. And then the, the, I love the ending of this because I think this encapsulates everything we've been talking about. Um, Because at the end, after everything that Brian has just told her, after Brian has told her how reckless she is and how much it's putting them in danger and how he almost died because of it. And, um, and how like how scared he is, how vulnerable she is. She ends the chapter talking about the fact that Brian said that he liked me. <laughs> and, and that's what, like he confessed his feelings for me after a fashion. I had a special place in his thoughts, even if he didn't know what they mean exactly. And it's like. <laughs> it's like Taylor, like it's like she heard all these things that he said. And the only one that she focused on was he kind of likes me. And I'm just yeah. like. Uh, you missed you missed the point entirely like and and i uh, this is like heartbreaking for me because i'm so i'm so upset with her yeah i mean it's i don't know if it's it's interesting to think about because i don't know if there's a clear answer as to like what's causing her blindness to his to his suffering here because like the dude was like sitting up awake basically staring at a wall yeah I, I, for who knows how long <laughs> and, and 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 she's just like well let's watch tv together and and uh, yeah yeah it, yeah yeah I, and i don't i don't know and it, that's like that's why i feel like the the steps forward taylor made in the last arc have kind of been walked back a little here like this this demonstrates that she is still very much controlled by that bully innocent paradigm um that yeah. she she categorizes things and she can only respond to it in that specific sort of way and it's like I, and, and there's there's a moment in here and matt we talked about this beforehand and this could be just us like reading into stuff way too much but at the end of this chapter we see taylor order new glasses she her contacts were run out and she has to take them out and she calls up uh coil's henchman and orders new glasses and when she switched from glasses to contacts, we we read that as a symbol of Taylor's growth and her change. Um, and if we read that as a symbol of her growth, then we have to look at reverting back to glasses as like a symbol of her regression in a way. 
Um, and I think I think if you look at chapter uh, arc 12 versus arc 13, you I think you can see that. I think you can see where she ma- takes steps forward and then she's taking steps back. And I think that's important to the overall uh, Slaughterhouse Nine arc because right now they just beat them, right? They they've killed one of them. Um, they've removed mannequin. Um, Bone Saw doesn't have hands, so they're winning, right? Kind of. But mm-hmm. like, what's the cost of that? Like, if the Slaughterhouse Nine are in Brockton Bay, they're here because they want to drive people to the breaking point and turn them into monsters. Mm-hmm. Then who's who's actually winning right now? Right. And I think that this this all goes into that, and it's it's masterful. Like it's absolutely masterful. I loved it. Yeah, I, I adored your observation about the glasses, and and I would say, you know, e- even if you know we open up the next chapter and she's like wearing contacts again, <laughs> um, that that doesn't matter to me because like to me from a <laughs> I'm just gonna take like a death of the author view- viewpoint for a second, even though I don't particularly care about that in, in, in general especially when the author like, uh, especially, especially is, is when the listening, to listening this. and, I, <laughs> and uh, I wish him well um but uh like the, the the placement of the fact that she takes off her contacts and orders glasses within this within this scene feels so like um purposeful to me yeah i agree um, i agree once you pointed it out i mean i didn't i frankly didn't notice and make the connection before that, but it's like, yeah, this is a, this is a signpost of of regression. I I, I think I think uh, I, I like that interpretation anyway. I'm not going to say that is what it is, but I like that interpretation. And that's the great thing about literature is, I think that's as valid interpretation as anything else. And Wild Bo could come back tomorrow and say, no, that's that's not what I was yeah. I was doing at all. She just yeah. ordered some glasses, and <laughs> I would still say, well, I like mine, and I'm keeping it. Yeah. Um, but and it's and, great. And, yeah, I mean, if I was an author and someone found something like that and something I wrote, I'd be like, that's awesome. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah, so so we're out, of, we're out of the main sequence of the arc and we're moving on to the final interlude for this arc, which is uh, Director Pigot. So uh, I always love POVs from normal humans living in this hell world. Uh, so she's doing paperwork, which is a nightmare of inc- of handwritten, increasingly frenzied stacks because they don't have any computers and things are too hectic. Uh, so in a sense, she's giving us a perspective on how the recent months have been for normal people. Yeah, I can't even imagine. It's like Hurricane Katrina times a thousand. Um, and then you take all electronics away too. So literally there are no electronics. Like, I, I can't. How do you do that? How do you survive? I don't know. Yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, yeah, so I, I think this may be the first time that we get to see stats on parahuman population. So normally the ratio is uh, 8,000 humans to one pair human in urban areas, but in Brockton Bay, it's it's much lower, meaning there are many more pair humans proportionally. Um, and she sees herself, interestingly, as representing the people without powers. Um, and that's interesting to me because she's in charge of the protectorate teams. Um, and, and so she's aware that the eyes of the nation are on, on Brockton Bay and they're on her in a sense. Yeah. I I like this viewpoint though, because I think she does demonstrate that fundamental disconnect between people with powers and people without, um, she speaks on behalf of the protectorate, but she also brings to the protectorate that point of view of normal people, because they can't possibly know what it's like to be a normal person in this world anymore. They are not normal. They are more yeah, and and they frequently display a complete disconnection with the concerns of normal people. Right, right. So Kidwin comes in and brings her a computer because they finally got some computers back in town. And she tells him to call the heroes back in for a meeting. And then she logs into the computer that he's given her and uses Dragon's invasive 10,000 factor authentication <laughs> uh, to log in. It's crazy. Yeah, which yeah, I thought that was hilarious. And that's our future, too, of course. So she starts reading up on the nine now that she has his computer. Uh, so she watches a few videos from from the over the years, mostly from prior members of the nine who are dead now. And then she watches case zero one, which depicts legend Alexandria, Idolan, and Hero preparing to engage Siberian for the first time. I think this may be the first on screen actual talking from Alexandria that we've seen in the in the 
or maybe from Eidolon too, actually. And uh, and this is also, I think, the first mention of Hero at all. Yeah, you're right about that second one. Um, I I don't remember with Alexandria. I know we've seen Eidolon before, um, but I, I I don't remember about Alexandria. But um, yeah, Hero. I had never heard of this person before. Um, in fact, when they talked about uh, Siberian walking away from uh, the triumvirate they specifically mentioned try so there was no there was no fourth person so i don't know if this was she's walked away from them multiple times or they've just kind of written this guy out of existence so they don't know that he was just completely decimated by this person i don't know yeah yeah i'm I'm not i'm not sure how we're supposed to read that at this point but yeah basically this this hero named named hero who apparently was fairly iconic if he was hanging out with these guys was torn limb from limb by siberian uh, and then she shattered Alexandria's eye socket. And of course, Alexandria is invulnerable. Um, yeah. Scott, do you notice the scar in our on Alexandria's face in our banner image now? I mean, I do now. I thought it was just like a part of the helmet or something. <laughs> um, this really cool attention and detail, though. I, I love our banner, banner image. Thank you so much, Lon Sheep. I love yeah. I, I have it's my background on my computer. I love it. It's awesome. Yes. I, I noticed the scar immediately and I chuckled. So. <laughs> Yeah, so then Bigot notices the actual legend uh, has intruded and is actually kind of like peering in through her window awkwardly. Uh, and we le- we learn so so he comes in and talks to her, um, and kind of as they're as they're walking along, we learn that Legend is gay and has adopted a child with his partner. Yeah, this is really cool um, because I think when I discussed both Flechette and Amy in previous arcs, um, there were some comments and responses around. Um, how uh gay people in this world within the story are uh thought of and represented in the world um and it seems like legend as being one of the most well-known well-respected superheroes around and what it appears to be is openly gay so it, it seems like this world is pretty progressive as far as that goes so that's pretty cool i like that a lot yeah yeah i, I like that touch quite a bit too so yeah, they continue to chat. They talk about the idea of second and third generation parahumans and how powers tend to manifest in children more by proximity to adult capes than by genetic relation to adult capes. And they also mention that there's a five-year-old third generation cape with powers now. Yeah, this is uh, this is really cool. I don't know how that would work. I really thought it was genetic, but now it seems like we're moving away from that. Um, but I like, you know... I like the hints at this being an exponential problem, right? Um, if if powers are manifesting sooner and sooner and easier and easier in future generations, um, and we know that the younger your powers manifest, the stronger you usually end up being, um, we're going to have a real problem in another like generation or two. Um, we're already having big problems right now, but like it's going to be more people. It's going to be more powerful people. It'll get worse and worse and worse, and it's basically non-sustainable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So they receive and, and read Skidder's message that she sent in the last chapter, alerting them that Burn Scar is dead and Bone Saw is temporarily disabled, and uh, make note of of her adding to the end, "Thanks for the help." I do appreciate that they're able to pick up the sarcasm in a written message because uh, I constantly have that problem. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Pigo should be good at that. <laughs> So then, yeah, then they call the meeting uh, with all the capes. Uh, so basically, that, that includes all the Brockton Bay heroes that we're that we know, and then all of Legends uh, Legends team. And she pep talks everyone, uh, telling them that they they'll need to attack hard and win absolutely, and basically just wipe out the nine without allowing the opportunity for the bioweapon to be used. It's a really really well thought out plan. <laughs> a lot of good plans. Yeah, just uh, just just fight really hard. Just. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. Um, and don't die. I really do like this though because, like, I remember it was a few arcs ago, and I was talking about like in the wake of uh, the Leviathan attack, how it just was kind of crazy that like all the heroes just left and left Brockton Bay to its own devices. Um, mm-hmm. But now we've got all these new people back, like like Legends here. We've got these people I've never heard of before. I don't think I don't think I've ever heard of uh, Prism or Cache or Ursa or Aurora. Is that how you pronounce that? Um, I don't know. I've never heard of these Sounds three cases before, so um, I think it's kind of showing how um, things have escalated with the nine now that they're calling people back in for help. Like things are getting bad, 
even though these people aren't allowed per the rules to directly interfere with things, they're here to try to help out. Um, and that's, that defines the, the escalating stakes a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll end the chapter with another note in, in that regard. So <laughs> yeah, the, the, the undersiders, um, turns out that they're, they're discussing the other villains, basically the, 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 the lay of the land. And they're mentioning that the, the undersiders and the undersiders actually come out of this whole arc looking extremely badass because according to the protectorate point of view on things, the undersiders went after the nine twice and four of the nine are now either dead, captured, or injured badly. Um, and Pigo says, the Undersiders do not pull their punches, which I thought was really interesting because uh, actually, funnily enough, they do. Yeah. S Skitter's constantly like choosing not to overly harm and especially not kill people. Um, and and then, then they say, the Travelers are more moderate, but the Travelers have somewhere between 16 and 56 kills under their belts. So I, I was I just wanted to ask, like, do you think this is cognitive dissonance under the hero's part? Uh, what, what, am I, what am I missing here? Yeah, I, probably a little. I mean, I think like I think it's like Skitter has become like the figurehead for the Undersiders and they just don't know what to do with her because she's just like this this confusing force that they can't figure out. And she seems like constantly winning, like she hasn't lost yet. And like, so they just don't know what to do. So if they're, if they're looking at threats, they can probably consider her like one of the biggest threats so far. Cause if she ever directly opposes them, um, she seems to pull wins out of her ass. And I think they're just associating the travelers as separate from that, even though they were fairly key in every victory they've had. It's just Skitter is the one that keeps talking to them with, with crazy bug person. So they just associate this stuff to the undersiders more than the other side. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they seem to not be aware of the role the Travelers played in, in this arc, yeah. actually. And and then, yeah, so so we already knew that Arms Master escaped, but but here here's where um, Pigo voices her suspicion that Dragon helped him escape. Yeah, I, I like that that suspicion comes from Pigo and not one of the other capes. I think it shows, intentionally or no, like this bond and trust between capes that work together. Um, and because Pico is this non superpowered individual, she can see outside of that because of course we know, or at least we have a pretty good idea that, yeah, um, dragon probably did help him escape. That's probably exactly what happened. Um, so I, I, I like that that comes from her and it shows like how capes can't perceive things that, that, uh, non capes can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, it is a very, a very interesting viewpoint um it, it's kind of an outsider viewpoint on uh, relative to to what we've been seeing up to this point she's just as untrusting of dragon as i am yeah that's both very gonna get stuff. hated We're both gonna get hated yeah, yeah you get lumped in with pigo <laughs> it's never that's good problem. it's never good yeah so her plan to deal with the nine is to use a combo of Vista and Clock Blocker to control the movements of the Nine, and then to drop a warhead from a stealth bomber on them. And uh, in, in the interim, Flechette will be testing her physics breaking bolts against Siberian. Yeah, this plan is about as good as uh, Trickster's. Um, let's just let's just drop a bomb on him, and then see if Flechette can work. And if yeah. not, um, okay, well, okay. I mean, on the other hand, it is funny to me because we were we were just talking about how like the when when the, the undersiders and travelers were, you know, ordering weapons and, and explosives and stuff. How, how that was, how that was like, you know, a different genre. And it's like, well, this is I don't know what genre this is, but the go is basically just like I have access to a stealth bomber. Yeah. I have access to whatever I need. I'm just gonna solve the problem. Like, like it yeah. doesn't even even need to be complicated. I just need to keep them in one spot for a little while. That's it. Yeah, I mean, this is this is classic government response to problem. Mm -hmm. Let's drop a bomb on it. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then after everyone leaves, except for Legend, she admits to him that they're not just dropping a conventional warhead. They're dropping Bakura's leftover stuff as well. Yeah, and they're specifically waiting until all the other villain groups engage in combat first before they do that to kill everyone at once. Um, <laughs> so this is what I get for saying I liked Legend earlier in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> because now Legend is party to this, and I'm sure he's not going to stop it from happening. Um, 
the system is corrupt. Burn it down. Skater for president. <laughs> um, I, I do think that we're. This is kind of a, a connection to the common thread we're seeing here, which is what the presence of these people, the the, the slaughterhouse nine, does to people. Um, we're seeing groups become monsters to defeat monsters, and we've seen that. And and, and I don't think Taylor and her group have have gotten there yet. But we see that here, like they're going to they're going to drop bombs and they don't seem to care. Like there's probably going to be civilians in the area. Do they care? Um, they're just being douchebags. <laughs> to go sucks. To go sucks. I hate her. Yeah. But and it really like you said, it is part of the same thread. It is this continuation of the logic of, you know, Skitter lying to Sundancer about whether they were people in, right. in the buildings. And, and it's practically the same thing. On a on a so much bigger totally scale, not. on a much bigger totally scale. Not the same thing. Yeah. It's it's awful. It's awful. And and yeah. like we can we can connect threads between Taylor and this, and still be able to say that this is way worse than what Taylor has done. But there are threads there. Yeah, and they're intentional. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that wraps up um, arc thirteen walkthrough. Let's let's talk about your speculations, Scott. All Why right. don't we first talk about? uh your old ones for just a second yeah yeah we're gonna have to go really quick with this because we are so so running late but yes we are we always do that but um yeah um so yeah i was right about brian um this so (laughs) like we were talking about i when i when i look at speculations i'm not thinking of the science fiction part of it i'm thinking of what would thematically be good so i saw we had just a chapter we were talk where we were talking about the existence of a second triggering event trigger trigger event people get mad at me when i say triggering event i'm sorry <laughs> um we had a second trigger event um we just had imp join the undersiders and put her so put her in a situation where she could be in harm's way and we knew that brian's uh, original trigger event was related to uh imp and we knew that, uh, or, or at least I guessed that the trigger event had had something to do with you being put in a very similar place of the first one, because that's when your powers start to expand a little bit, and expanding to a certain point means second trigger event. So I put all those things together and made an educated guess. Um, I didn't think that Brian was going to be the first one we saw. Um, I thought it was probably going to be some other people first, and then maybe he would come later. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was a guess. It was cool. I'm glad it happened. Um, I'm, I don't consider myself brilliant, but I'm pretty happy with that one. Yeah. Just to be honest that that when you, when you originally said that one, I was so like jaw on the floor about it (laughs) that that I like, I had to go back and be like, how did he figure that out? And and then of course, you know, what you just explained makes perfect sense, but I I certainly didn't guess that. Yeah. And and again, I think, I think a lot of this is just how much time we're taking with this mm-hmm. thing every week like we are we are spending hours sitting down and picking through this thing picking through details and and the 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 story and the theme details are what i really dive into so um this stuff when i'm staring at it this intently um stuff jumps out at me that just a casual person reading it would not see at least not yeah. on the first time through so i don't think i'm special in any way i'm just weirdly obsessive so that, yeah. there's that well, you get a lot of internet points for this. So okay, cool, congratulations. Cool. So uh, then my new ones, I'll go through these really quickly because I think we talked about them all just about. Um, I, I said that the passenger inside each cape, quote unquote passenger, um, whether it's dead or alive or in there somewhere, uh, it has the ability on some level to manipulate actions or emotions of uh, their host. Um, and I think that's why we see this question around why do all these powers conflict uh, in nature um why are people fighting each other so much is i think it has something to do with that um the second one is that arms master is going to show up and wreck some shit during the final confrontation with the slaughterhouse nine um probably with a dragon uh, robo suit in tow um i think this is going to be really cool and have some good conflict with skitter and then he'll run away and uh and do some stuff with dragon We'll have some robo babies and hunt down dragon slayers um all right some of that's a joke but some of that's serious <laughs> Um, and I think, I think Parian, I, I went back and forth on this. This is my third one. I think Parian is going to want revenge on the Slaughterhouse Nine. I was thinking, I was trying to go back and forth on whether I thought she's going to be so broken from this. She's just done. But I, I think she's going to want revenge. I think, I don't think we've seen the last of her. So I think he's going to join the, 
Undersider Traveler group temporarily to help um, with uh, with this threat. Um, I still think her and Flechette are going to fall in love somewhere down the road, and I don't think she's going to be a permanent member of this group or anything, but I think they're going to have her help to get rid of these scumbag people. So that's number three. All right. Fantastic. All right, let's wrap this thing up because we're on two hours and 30 minutes. Okay. Not bad. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that wraps up Arc 13 Snare. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. I'm sorry I didn't get to live tweet last week. I will be doing it this week for uh, for this, this upcoming section, so follow me there if you want to see me do that. You can also follow me on my personal Twitter, Twitter at scottdaily85, that's a D-A-L-Y, and Matt at mordinamail. That's right. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Overcast, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. That's D-A-L-Y. If you like what we do here and want to help make sure we keep doing more, consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Special thanks to new producer Adam. Thanks so much for contributing to what we're doing here. It really means so much. Also, while you're over there at Patreon, make sure to stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money in there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. Yeah, and and as always, if you're one of those that can't spare any any extra cash right now, we completely understand. But you can still help us out. Um, if you can share the podcast with with everyone you know, that'd be great. Worm Two is coming out sometime this year. It's right around the corner, so like now's the perfect time uh, to get back into it and get refreshed with Worm. And uh, you can do that with us, and it'll be a lot of fun. Um, also, if you could take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes. We would really appreciate that. Today's spotlight review comes from user DK367. Uh, DK367 says, Listening to it brings back the magic of reading Worm for the first time. Matt and Scott's analysis brings highlights, thematic elements I never noticed on a first read-through, and has given me a new perspective on Taylor's characterization and journey. Also, love, love, love Scott's predictions. Keep it up. Thank you. I love my predictions, too. And, and, and thanks for that review as always guys, like your kind words are so great. We really appreciate it. Um, and every review and rating on iTunes helps us get noticed and helps bring more people to this and more people to share worm with. So uh, please keep it up. We love you all. Thank you. Yes, it is genuinely motivating. So next week we jump into arc 14 pray. This is another really long one. So we're unfortunately going to have to carve it up into two separate episodes. Next week's episode will cover uh, 14.1 through 14.6, unless there's a really compelling reason to change that. And the following week, we'll cover the remaining chapters in the arc, as well as the two interludes. Uh, as you know, we'd really love to keep these stories together, but there's just uh, far too much information to cover. And Scott likes to talk far too much. Speaking of which, Scott, arc 14 is called Prey. And what do you think that means? I think it means someone's going to do some hunting. And uh, this arc will be a battle between the Undersiders and the Nine to discover which is the predator and which is the prey. Or knowing where it's uh, probably probably both. It's probably, mm -hmm. probably both. A wise, if vague, guess, my friend. But we will find out next Wednesday when we cover part one of Arc 14 Prey. Mm -hmm.